Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, and particularly our listeners in the British Isles, to this exciting and enticing game. And we have four enticing and exciting players who have played the game with great panache in the past, and we're thrilled to welcome them back because they're extremely talented at playing it. They're four of the finest comedians that we have in our country. They are Paul Merton, June and Clary, Kit Hesketh Harvey and Linda Smith. And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score, and she will blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Arts Centre in the lovely town of Kings Lynn in that beautiful county of Norfolk and we have a humorous passionate Kings Lynn audience in front of us <laughs> ready to cheer us on our way right as we start the show with a Norfolk man himself who doesn't live very far away Kit Hesketh Harvey Kit the subject is my first job tell us something about my first job in just a minute, starting now. My first job was an apprentice to Nicholas Parsons, who, <laughs> before he rose to the dizzy heights you now see, majestic and bearing so much gravitas, was an artificial inseminator of pigs. <laughs> a task which is rightly performed with great momentum in this part of the world. He and I would set off with a spring in our step, armed only with our marigold gloves and a washing-up bowl. <laughs> and a copy of Crackling, a lewdly pornographic magazine which showed pictures of Kevin Bacon and Mia Farrow in positions of enticing and exciting abandon. Now, the thing about the porcine species is that the male genitalia is corkscrew-shaped, so I would hold the animal down while Nicholas would spin like a Catherine wheel. While I was spinning like the Catherine wheel, Paul Burton challenged you. Not before time, I think, in view of what you were saying. Right, Paul, what was your challenge? It was a repetition of Nicholas. Yes, oh, I Lord, know. Oh, yes, we were, weren't we? I know. Yeah. Some people say you can't have too much repetition of Nicholas, but uh, <laughs> um, I wish really I hadn't said that. It is really corkscrew shape. It is, really? Yes, ask it them. Is. Ask them, they know. <laughs> So if a pig's having a romantic evening, they can open a bottle of wine. <laughs> it makes the wine taste a bit funny. <laughs> I think we should go no further down this particular line, though it is obviously highly appreciated by everybody here in Kings Lynn. Um, <laughs> Paul, yes, he did repeat Nicholas, so that is repetition, and you have a correct challenge, and you gain a point for that, of course, and you take over the subject. There are 14 seconds available. My first job starting now. My very first job, I think, was in the summer of 1977. I was working as a pub cleaner. I only lasted about six hours. I got the sack. I wasn't particularly good. And they paid me off with five pounds in cash, which I was particularly pleased with, because in those days... Um, Kit Hesketh, Harvey oh, Sorry, it's, it's me, but there were two particular lists there. Yes, there were there? two particular no, lists. Yes, sorry. indeed, there were. So, Kit, you've cleverly mm -hmm. got in with one second to go on a correct challenge of repetition. You get a point for your challenge and you take back the subject of my first job starting now. Our lives were in a rut. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point, and it was Kit Hesketh, Harvey, who has two points at the end of the round to Paul's one. And Linda Smith, your turn to begin. The subject is. Belts and braces. Tell us something about belts and braces in 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. Belt and braces is a phrase that means to be very safety conscious, to be very cautious. And it's not, therefore, an epithet that could be applied to rail track at the moment, <laughs> whose somewhat cavalier attitude to the public good means that every journey undertaken in Britain is very similar to that rail trip taken by Omar Sharif in Dr Shivago. Uh, Julian Clary has challenged you. Are we not deviating. What from? From the subject. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a bit rich. Accused of deviation by Julian Clary. 
I think you need your right. So you gain a point for that. It's belts and braces and 38 seconds available starting now. I decided to dress for comfort to the journey to Norfolk <laughs> and I wore a pair of one-size-fits-all trousers. Unfortunately, there were no loops for a belt and there were no buttons for braces and I popped over the road to the newsagent before I got in the car and I came out of there clutching a bottle of mineral water and various things which I won't go into to amuse me during the journey. And do you know my trousers... Uh, Linda Smith Charles. <laughs> Were there two journeys? There weren't two journeys. The reason I paused, you missed the fact there were two trousers. But he didn't challenge what, on trousers, so legs. I can't allow it. So Julian has a point for an incorrect challenge, and he keeps belt and braces, and he has 15 seconds. <laughs> Thank you for applauding my wisdom. There we are. There we are. <laughs> 15 seconds, Julian. Belt and braces starting now. It was a kind of gangster rap look as they worked their way further down my thighs, but I thought I could carry it off. I thought, who cares if I'm 41? Uh, Kit has good Harvey Chan. So there were two I thoughts. Then. Uh, there were two I thoughts, definitely, yes. Seven seconds are available now. You've got another point, uh, Kit, for a correct challenge. Belton Braces is with you starting now. Belton is a charming village in the nearby county of Rutland, and the dentists there furnish the teenagers of that esteemed county help. Sorry, uh, two um, counties. Paul Town. Two counties. Two counties, yes, Paul. You've got him at half a second oh. to go. <laughs> um, belt and braces starting now. Just do them up. <laughs> so, Paul Merton speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point on that occasion. He's now equal with Kit Hesketh Harvey in the lead. Julian Clary is in second place, then Linda Smith. And um, Paul Merton, it is your turn to begin. And the subject is. Oh, very topical. The Fens. <laughs> Tell us something about the Fens starting now. What can I say about the Fens that wouldn't immediately exhibit my ignorance about them? It's a wonderful part of the world. In fact, I... Um, can I go He's exhibiting his ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> You live in the Fens and you applaud that remark. <laughs> anyway, they enjoyed it so much. I'll give you a bonus point for your witty response. Uh, but you weren't, it wasn't a challenge when the rules were just a minute. So Paul gets a point for being interrupted. He keeps the Fens. Well, he doesn't keep the Fens. He keeps the subject <laughs> of the Fens. And 54 seconds starting now. Perhaps the <laughs> fenniest bit is about ten miles from here, and it's so Fenlandish that people just go <laughs> mad about it. So there's nothing like this at home. And they take photographs of the fens, and they take, put water into us, special cups that they make out of knitting needles. Why is nobody challenging this? <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at me as if you're learning something. <laughs> Linda eventually challenged. Linda, yes. Well, all, all of them, probably. All of them, but hesitation's <laughs> enough, isn't it? Right. 37 seconds. The Fens with you, Linda, starting now. The Fens are a lovely couple that we met on holiday when we were <laughs> tourists. They said they'd keep in touch with us, and sadly they did. So now we go everywhere with the Fens. I'm getting a little bit sick of them, to be perfectly frank with you. I cannot sneak out of the house without the Fens turning up. There they are saying, cooey, thought you were going out, thought we'd join you. So the Fens... Um, Julian, declare a challenge. There were two thoughts. Yes, I'm afraid there were. So, Julian, well, listen, uh, another point. <clears throat> 16 seconds, the Fens are starting now. The Fens are a watery paradise for birds, and it's not generally known, but I was a duck in a former life. <laughs> I can't be more specific than that, but I know I had black and white feathers, and I lived on the Fens. I used to bob about, <laughs> and every Friday afternoon I would... <laughs> <laughs> What a lovely picture he paints. And with that extra point, says the whistle when Grooning Clary has moved forward, he's now equal with Linda Smith and Paul Merton in second place. Only one point behind our leader, Kit Hesketh Harvey. And Kit, your turn to begin. The subject, a false economy. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. In Cambridge, it's computers. In Norwich, it's insurance. Here in King's Lynn, we have a manufacturing industry catering to the local community, making prosthetic limbs, toupees, <laughs> glass eyes, <laughs> dental plates, wonder bras, and penile implants. We have, in short, a false economy. <laughs> if you go down to the back streets, of King's Lynn, and you should see a shop saying second hand, it means exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a lovely thought, right? Julian, you challenged. I hate to interrupt, but there were two King's Lynn's. Well, I'm and sorry, there, there can't yeah. be enough King's Lynn's. I think. Uh, no, there can't <laughs> be enough. <laughs> 
Julian, the correct challenge, 30 seconds for you, available still on a false economy starting now. False economy. I got a lift to King's Lynn today with Paul Merton's girlfriend. I thought that would be a saving. But as we drove <laughs> down the motorway, there was a brush with death. <laughs> Suddenly, she did a kind of S-shaped -S swerve, and um, I thought, oh, I'm going to meet my maker. Then she said, oh, I don't know what happened there. I think maybe someone opened the window, and the rush of air going out the window caused this... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I've done it back to him now. Window, window. window. I'm sorry. The window, Two yes. Windows. Yeah, yeah there were four windows in there. Were there four windows in there? Yes. <laughs> Nine seconds available, kit for a false economy with you starting now. So if you should lose a part of your body through leprosy or just plain carelessness, come to the back streets of Lynn Regis, bishops of that nomenclature, as it was called. <laughs> So, Ket Hesketh Harvey speaking as a whistle when going the little point and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Linda Smith, it's your turn to begin. Oh, the high jump. You have 60 seconds as usual, starting now. The high jump is a sport that I was actually quite good at at school, not because I'm particularly athletic, but I'm just quite tall. So I could just climb over the high jump. In the end, it didn't really seem worth having the competition. The gym teacher would just measure us all and the tallest one would win. <laughs> Invariably, this child was my good self. So that was the only sport that I was any good at. The high jump also means when, oh, you're for it, you're going to get into some kind of trouble. Um, and and this is not a... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton, new talent. But it's an erm. Um, yes, there an was an erm, um, which but is... I in... meant to say that. Yes. yes. <laughs> which is in uh, hesitation. Right, Paul, you have 29 seconds. The subject is uh, the high jump starting now. It's one of the great Olympic disciplines. In fact, one of the finest men ever to take part in the Olympian races, games, <laughs> if you like. Linda, got it back. No, I, I, let, take that back, because I thought he just... Oh, I thought he was going to say Olympics again. He said Olympian. Mm. Right. Masterly. Oh, oh, Masterly you swerve. You didn't want him for hesitation, so you know the first challenge is incorrect. Paul, you still have the subject. Another point to you. 22 seconds on the high jump, starting now. There was a man called Fosbury in the 1968 Olympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> Kit, you challenge first. Yes, <laughs> right, easy this time. 18 seconds, Kit, the high jump starting now. Any jump in Norfolk, of course, is a high jump because we have no hills. <laughs> but what amazes me is further up the coast towards Liverpool at Aintree. Uh, <laughs> Julian challenge. Hesitation. Yes, yes, there was. Further up the coast yes, to I'm Liverpool. And round. <laughs> right round the top and down the other side. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ten seconds, Julian, the high jump starting now. I've always been interested in the high jump and particularly fascinated by pole vaulting, <laughs> which in many senses is a close cousin of... <laughs> So, Julian Clary speaking as a whistle when again the extra point. He's now only one point behind our leader, Kit Hesketh Harvey, and then Paul Merton and Linda Smith in that order. And, Paul, your turn to begin. My new hat. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Well, this is an extraordinary coincidence, because only three weeks ago I bought a new hat. I've never really particularly purchased a hat before, but this one was an absolute corker. I was going to meet somebody, and I was early, and it was raining, and I thought, well, I don't want to sit around getting wet, so I'll buy a hat. So I went to this hat shop, and I said, excuse me, do you sell hats in here? And the man said, well, we do. That's why we called, uh, you know, what I said before. And I said, OK, I'll have one. <laughs> and I bought the most beautiful thing. It looks like one of those Orson Welles hats. It's got a sort of black colour to it, there's a brim, quite a wide particular piece of cloth hanging over the edge there, and it looks like I'm selling port. It's a wonderful, beautiful I'm, I'm quite romantic in it. <laughs> Kids has challenged you. You had wonderful and beautiful before, yes, I think. You, did have oh, you should see me in the hat. I want to, I want to. <laughs> Right, but you did repeat those words, so the repetition, a point to you, Kit, and the subject of my new hat, and you have 27 seconds starting now. Flanders and Swan, the great songwriters and lyricists of the 1960s, had a show called At the Drop of a Hat, which they followed with another, literally inserted into that phrase, Vieux Chapeau, old hat, it means a old hat. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> Julian, you challenge first. Shouldn't it be Vieux? No. no, it's masculine, actually. No, it's masculine, it's, it's vieux. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, something else, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were challenging for the, the, his... his uh, in the gender. French. Well, I was, but <clears throat> I can change the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to do it very quickly. Hesitation. I don't think he hesitated. <laughs> no, 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 and you can't have him on gender. I'm sorry. Mm. Not just... Who keeps pressing that buzzer? Kit. It's me. Yes, um, yes. I, I'm challenging myself for repetition of old hat. 
<laughs> well, as that now at last is a correct challenge, I'll give you a point Thank for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you keep the subject. Thank you. Because you challenge yourself, of course, naturally. What else could you do? 13 seconds, my new hat starting now. A phrase which is in contrast to new hat because the change of fashion in hats was very rapid and your hat could wear out before it had passed... No, wrong way round. Sorry. Paul challenge. Hesitation. Absolutely. What rubbish were you talking about? I was talking about gibberish. It is gibberish. Through my hat, I was talking about. It about. happens. Yeah. Through your hat. Right. Through your chapeau. Right, four seconds. My new hat, Paul, starting now. £45, pounds, and I have to say it was very well <laughs> spent indeed. It looks wonderful. <laughs> so Paul Merton speaking as a whistle when got that extra point to increase his lead. Kit Hesketh Harvey is trailing him just a little and the other two are behind. And Kit, it's your turn to begin the subject. Oh, it's a topical <coughs> local subject which I'm sure you can go with your usual erudition on. Captain Vancouver. Tell us something about Captain Vancouver. <laughs> Now all the audience know about Captain Vancouver. Now let's hear the listeners can discover something from Kit on Captain Vancouver starting now. Well, here in Norfolk, we're surrounded on three sides by sea, so we're noted for the plenitude of our seamen. And one of these was <laughs> Captain Vancouver, who, like Admiral Lord Nelson over at Burnham Thorpe, was a county-bred boy. He came from King's Lynn. He was a son of this fair borough, lived in a great big white house at the other end of the town from where we're now sitting and where a statue has been erected in his memory. He sailed up the northwest coast of a America, all the way from San Francisco to Alaska, charting the archipelago, which is very complicated, that part of lineage. People thought he'd spat his tapioca out over the maps <laughs> when he brought them back. But what a hero he was. He also accompanied James Cook to Australia and New Zealand. And this lovely town in which I sit and uh, which I am a very proud citizen have every right to be glorious. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, so close. Oh, it's a tough game to it keep is going. Is. The audience enjoyed it very much. But, Julian, you challenged with eight seconds to go. What was it? Oh, um, oh hesitation. Hesitation. Yeah. Yes, it was hesitation. But uh, well done, um, Kit. Uh, eight seconds. Will you tell us something about Captain Vancouver, Julian, starting now? <laughs> well, I'll try. I, uh, all challenged. Hesitation. <laughs> no! No. He, he just smiled and the audience laughed and he, he tried to pick it up. I don't know why they smiled, but, um, but maybe we'll discover in a moment. No, no, anyway, half a second, that's all. Give the oh, no. boy a chance to get going, <laughs> really. Six and a half seconds, Captain Vancouver Julian starting now. Well, I expect he had a beard and he changed his underpants every Friday. <laughs> Kit challenged him. He didn't, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> Well, Nick, listen, what, what? did he have a beard or not? It's up to you. Uh, not about the beard. It was the underpants he challenged on. No, and, he, uh, he never and, changed his underpants. Well, nobody in those days did change them no, very much. And if you're at no. sea all that time, of course yeah, you may... He didn't but have you... a beard. There's a statue of him. You can go look at it. But you challenged on the underpants. No, I challenged on the beard. Oh, I see. Mm. If you challenge on the beard, then I've got to give it to you, I'm afraid. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> I've Kevin, always right? wanted you to say that. Was that a... <laughs> Why are you giving it to him? Because you said he had his beard. Well, we, we, all we've established is the statue doesn't have a beard, but it's very difficult to do beards on statues. That's the very thing. I expect he had a beard at some time. Uh, or other. I, yes, actually, no, Julian, Julian, no, 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 I'm, I'm, always, <laughs> I'm always very fair. You have put into my mind a thought. I, I can assume that at some time during his voyage and his travels, he might have grown a beard. Oh, so, so, four seconds on. Captain Vancouver starting now. Captain Vancouver used to dress up as a woman every Thursday <laughs> and parade round the docks. Uh, Paul challenged. Deviation, it was every Friday. Yeah. <laughs> if you go and see his statue, every Friday he's wearing a woman's dress. He used to change his underpants every Friday. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, I've got it wrong. Now, then. as far as I know, I can here say that he did not. He wasn't into cross-dressing. All those months medicine. at sea, you're telling me? Yeah. <laughs> Have he... you got any television? I know, but no, all those months of sea, he didn't go. They never went, they hadn't got, the, they couldn't put all the clothes into their seamen's chests. I beg, I beg your pardon. pardon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was He might have challenge. been into all kinds of deviation, but I, he didn't cross dress while he was at sea. So I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Paul on this occasion. Paul, you have half a second to tell us something about cross dressing. No, no, about. Um, <laughs> about Captain Vancouver starting now. He's known as the Mary of the Seven Seas. <laughs>
So Paul Merton speaking as a whistle when gain the next point, he's just a little bit further ahead of Julian Clare and Kitty Seth Harvey, who are equal in mm. second place. Linda Smith comes a little way behind them, and it is her turn to begin. And the subject, Linda, is garden gnomes. Tell us something about garden gnomes in 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. Garden <clears throat> gnomes are little ornaments with funny faces and beards, kind of idealised versions of Robin Cook. My <laughs> Auntie Helen liked garden gnomes. She collected them deliberately. Obviously, they didn't just accrue around her. But because she was a soft-hearted lady, she didn't like to leave garden gnomes in the garden. So she put them in her living room in front of the TV. Hordes of them. She was sweet, but clinically mad and I suspect that any genes I have inherited from her would not be of the good variety. John Major's parents famously made garden gnomes, although in a rather po-faced way he referred to them as garden ornaments. What a miserable sod. <laughs> <laughs> Julian Clary, you challenged. Two ornaments. Yes, mm. that's right. She did have ornaments before. Well, listen, Julian, 13 seconds. Tell us something about garden gnomes starting now. I've no time for garden gnomes. I think it's a sign of bad taste, and whenever I see one, I feel obliged to kick it in the head, <laughs> knock it over, and roll it round and down into the lo local ditch. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, you challenge. A general petering out. Yes, well, he's a taste for this, all that. So you've got the subject back, Linda, of garden gnomes with three seconds to go, starting now. Garden gnomes are delightful, quite in contrast to what Julian... <laughs> So, Linda Smith speaking as the whistle went and gained other points in that round as well as the one for speaking when the whistle went, uh, has leapt forward. Uh, but unless she's still in fourth place. But uh, <laughs> she's... Um, but no, no, no. I mean, the, it's the contribution, not the points, isn't it? And uh, only just behind Julian Clary and Kit Hesketh Harvey. And one ahead of them is Paul Merton. And, Julian, your turn to begin. The subject, magic. Tell us something about magic in 60 seconds. You, you were absolutely mesmerised then, the audience was. I said, I really had them in the palm of my hand for a moment. The magic, Julian, 60 seconds, starting now. Magic. Well, I'm a member of a coven comprising of me, Lily Savage, Richard Whiteley and Anne Robinson. <laughs> And we're responsible for an awful lot of magic. I don't do my own ironing, you know. Oh, no. We just chant round the pot and suddenly it's all done. We do a lot of good things. I'm actually responsible for Dale Winton getting a third series of The Other Half. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. And we can do anything you want, really. You just write in to us and tell us about your troubles and your traumas. Uh, uh, Linda smith A uh, Lot of usses. Yes, there was us, yes, us, Quite us, a few. us, yes. Yes, I mean, once you let it go, but two or three times. All right, Linda, <laughs> benefit of the doubt. Got to draw the line somewhere. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Really. And I've drawn it now for you, and you have 28 seconds on magic starting now. Magic is possibly the most irritating form of entertainment known to humanity, <laughs> and it has given the wretched Paul Daniels a very good career. Uh, Paul Merton, John. Paper tearing's worse. <laughs> I'd put that under allied trades. Would you? <laughs> So what is your challenge Paper within the rules? Paper tearing's worse than magic. Have you got a, a genuine challenge within the rules of just a minute? Uh, deviation. Why? Because I didn't agree with her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's you deviating, that's, isn't it, Paul? Well, it could be. Right. Uh, no, I disagree, Paul. You, uh, uh, magic is still with you, Linda, and there are 20 seconds left starting now. Magic shows make my heart sink. Even as a child, they used to annoy me intensely. Of course it's not magic, I think. There isn't really a rabbit in your hat, you foolish old man who was just the cheapest one in the local paper that my parents could find to come and, so to speak, entertain us. I get... <laughs> well, Linda, you won't be asked to the Magic Circles conference next year. And really, oh, but well. <laughs> there live we are. With it. But your thoughts on magic kept you going until the whistle went, gained that extra point, and you really have leapt forward now. You are equal now with uh, Kit Heskiff Harvey, one point behind Julian Clary, and he's two points behind Paul Merton as we move into the final round. Paul Merton, your turn to begin. 
The practical jokes. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Practical jokes can often have a nasty, brutish kind of quality, can't they? If I was to wire Nicholas Parsons up to the national grid, there would be a tremendous hoo-ha from the audience, everybody rushing forward desperately to put the plug in before anyone else. <laughs> and it would be terrible to do such an awful thing. There was a practical joker in the 1920s called Horace Devere Cole who gained some no- notoriety for... Kiddos is our bitch. No to no to no to no to no to no to no we call that hesitation. 37 seconds are available. Practical jokes is with you kids starting now. Inspected the entire fleet at Portsmouth, pretending he was an Indian Raja. My favourite practical joke is the one where you go to a group of workmen who are digging a hole in the street and tell them there's a group of students coming along dressed as... Uh, Julian Challenge. <laughs> Too Two many groups. groups. Sorry. Two groups, yes, yeah. right. Julian, you've got in on the last subject, practical jokes. 28 seconds available, starting now. I said to Paul Merton the other day, would you like to have a bite of my sausage? And do you know, it wasn't really a sausage. It was a saveloy. You should have seen the look on his face. He was mortified. He said, has this ruined me for married life? I said, no. <laughs> I've never seen you dry yourself up with your own perverse thoughts, actually, Julian. Right, uh, Kit, you challenge I was like, Paul Martin, you're a man or a mouse. You're, you're going to take all this. It's libel. It's libel. <laughs> but you didn't challenge for libel. I mean, you know... No, I wanted deviation. to know what I'd done. I thought maybe I'd... What are you doing there? <laughs> I just dropped my hanky. Um, yeah. Kit, you had a correct challenge, and you have ten seconds. Tell us something about practical jokes starting now. You tell them there's some policemen coming along, and in fact they're students. Then you tell the... Uh, poor challenge. <laughs> you did say students You did say students. You'll never get this story out, will you? <laughs> well, we'll have it after, after 60 seconds. Paul, you got in first. Practical jokes, six seconds available, starting now. One practical joke I heard about concerned Tommy Steele when he was appearing at London Palladium in the hit musical... <laughs> Paul Merton was speaking as a whistle when gain that extra point. So let me give you the final score because, alas, we have no more time to play this game that we enjoy so much. Uh, Linda Smith, who has triumphed admirably in the past, came uh, in just in fourth place, a little way behind Kit Hesketh Harvey and Julian Clary, who were linked together in second place. Charming. <laughs> it's charming, isn't it? And a few points ahead of them was Paul Merton. So, Paul, we say once again, you are the winner this week. Right. <laughs> so it only remains for me to say thank you to our four delightful players of the game, Kit Hesketh Harvey, Linda Smith, Paul Merton and Julian Clary. We also um, must thank our lovely audience here in King's Lynn, but particularly I'd like to thank Janet Saplehurst, who helps me keep the score, blows her whistle so well, and our producer... Uh, Claire Jones, who makes sure that it all goes out smoothly with uh, some of the things that you may have suggested you might have heard, but, <laughs> but we're not like that. This is Radio 4. Nothing has to be edited. But we are deeply indebted to our creator of the game, Ian Mesita, and we are indebted to our lovely audience here in Kings Lynn. From them, from our panel, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Hope you tune in the next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you, thank you, hello. My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country but throughout the world, but also to welcome to the show four highly talented, extremely humorous and witty players of the game. So will you please welcome, in no order of seniority, Graham Norton, Jenny Eclair, Tim Rice and Tony Hawks, all four of them. As usual, I am going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from that subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who is going to help me keep the score, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Turner Sims Concert Hall in the University of Southampton. And we have before us a highly literate, intelligent... <laughs> University audience mingling with some of the fine burgers of Southampton and places further afield like Portsmouth. And we're going to start the show this week with Tony Hawks. Tony, the subject, oh, what a lovely one to start with, bananas. 
Tell us something about bananas in just a minute, starting now. Do you know, I have never seen a straight banana, but this may be because I mainly hang around in gay banana clubs. <laughs> in my opinion, though, it is fair to say the banana is possibly the funniest of all fruits. It's... Uh, Tim Rice has challenged. A deviation, I think pineapples are hilarious. <laughs> I it's think that's true, a lovely right? comment, but have you got a challenge with the rules of just a minute, Tim? Deviation. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll be generous. I'll give you a bonus point because the audience enjoyed the remark, but I don't think it was devious within the rules of just a minute. So, Tony, you have a point for an incorrect challenge. You keep the subject, and there are 43 seconds left. Bananas starting now. If I say pineapple now, it'll be interesting to watch how funny Tim writes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jenny Claire, you challenge. I've got it wrong. I think he said funny and funniest. So actually, Tony, you're oh, right. I'm so sorry. Don't I get apologize. a point. <laughs> Keep going. You're doing ever so well. <laughs> it's just lovely to hear from you, Good Jenny. Good luck. <laughs> All that happens is he gets another point for an incorrect challenge and he keeps the subject. And at 33 seconds, bananas, Tony, starting now. If you remove a banana skin and toss it onto the floor, what hilarious consequences may follow if you hide... Uh, Jenny, a challenge again. Hilarious. He did say yeah, hilarious He did say twice. hilarious before. Hmm, yes. <laughs> So, well, listen, Jenny, you have the subject, because you have a point, of course, for a correct challenge as well. You have 30 seconds to tell us something about bananas starting now. Full of potassium. I like them long and firm, with a greenish tinge, perhaps with a splash of carnation milk, because I have a very sophisticated palate. As the others have said, a very amusing... <coughs> um, Tim Rice challenge. Two berries. Yes, you said very before. <laughs> Tim, a correct challenge to take over the subject is bananas. 17 seconds available starting now. Even funnier than the banana or pineapple is the kumquat, which is an extremely obscure fruit that I have on many occasions dipped in... Uh, Graham Norton challenge. But that is deviation now, isn't it? Why? Because he's talking about kumquats. kumquats. <laughs> <laughs> so he's deviating... <laughs> Graham, you've got him with eight seconds to go, having got a point, of course. Correct challenge. Bananas is with you, starting now. In the bird world, a canary was kicked out of the feathered police force for corruption. And I thought, how like a banana, yellow and then... <laughs> So everybody scored points in that round, and whoever speaks when the whistle goes gets an extra point. It was uh, Graham Norton, so he has two, Tim has two, Tony has two, and Jenny has one. Tim, will you take the next round? The subject is a small world. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. It is indeed a small world, this tiny globe on which we live, but there are some even smaller, viz, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, or Mars. But let's go back to our own little place here, because if you ever plan to motor west, just take my way. It's the highway. It's the best. <laughs> Get your kicks on Route 66. It winds from Chicago to L.A. more than 2,000 miles all the way. Get... <laughs> Jenny, you challenge. Well, he's gone mad. <laughs> I saw him drinking in the green room. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that a slight deviation. Wasn't he just going on about roads? I was illustrating what a small world it was by the fact that one road can take you anywhere, man. Actually, I don't think he was... <laughs> Jenny, I don't think he was deviating... Give it him from... back. Give him back the ball. No, he's got the ball. He hasn't okay. lost it yet, Jenny. Uh -oh. It's still a small world with Tim. And, Tim, there are 32 seconds available, starting now. It is indeed a small world. <laughs> uh, Tony Hawke's challenge. A uh, repetition of indeed. You said indeed before. Um, That's how you started the first time. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you've got a correct challenge, another point in 30 seconds, and a small world starting now. I've always liked the line by the US comedian Stephen Wright, who said, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. And how true that is. If one considers the amount of labour that would be required for the said task, it could take two or three weeks, depending on how arduous a worker you were. Of course, most people say it's a small world when they bump into somebody at an airport or somewhere like that. Uh, Tim Rice. I thought he was going to do somewhere twice, but he didn't, did he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
I like the way people cave in as soon as they challenge us. <laughs> it's these anticipatory challenges which are fascinating. Uh, Tim, an incorrect challenge, but uh, Tony, another point. And three seconds still, a small world starting now. Hello, Bob. I didn't expect to see you here. I thought that you... <laughs> Tony Hawks was on a roll there and kept going to the whistle when gained that extra point for doing so and gained other points in the round, so he's taken the lead at the end of that round. Graham Norton, your turn to begin. The subject is commercials. Tell us something about commercials in just a minute, starting now. Watching a commercial recently, I was attracted to a product that promised me that my toilet could smell like a forest glade. <laughs> I purchased said thing, and sure enough, it did smell like a wooded... Uh, uh Jenny Chuck. Smell. There were too many smells. <laughs> 45 seconds, Jenny. You had a correct challenge. Commercials starting now. You do loads of commercials, Graham Norton. You do windy. <laughs> uh, Tim Challenge. Two you do's. You do. Yeah. Uh, 42 seconds for you, Tim, on commercials starting now. I've been approached many times to advertise or plug something, but have always refused because I regard this as a degradation. Uh, Jenny Challenge. Oh, he stuttered and spluttered and dribbled came out of his mouth. <laughs> Hesitation. Not quite, darling. He, Do he you was. Think? He's in the middle of a war. A big, big, gaga like that. It's <laughs> tough enough to keep going. He was teetering on the verge of uh, stuttering, but no, degradation just about came out without a hesitation. Okay. So I give him the benefit of the doubt. 33 seconds available. Commercials are starting now. I saw a program the other night called The 100 Best Commercials of All Time. It went on and continued all through the Tony, evening. Tony, you challenged. Well, I, actually, I buzzed over him saying on for the second time. No. Did you say it? Did you say went, it? No, you, I was extremely clever. No, what no. did you say? He uh, set you up for that one. On, on, and... on and continued, I think. Uh, he well. did. <laughs> He did not repeat on, and it's 24 seconds still with you on commercials, Tim, starting now. The commercial that I thought was the best of the lot and should have been at number one was the one where the dog and the cat and the mouse all walk up to the fire to the strains of the Shirelles singing, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? Let us go back to 1961 and relive that wonderful song. Tonight, you're mine completely. <laughs> you freak your love so sweetly. I see the magic of your eyes, but... And then the title comes in again. <laughs> Tim Rice was speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point for doing so, and also others in the round has leapt forward. He's now equal in the lead with Tony Hawks, and Tony, it's your turn to begin. A stitch in time. That's the subject. Talk on it. 60 seconds are available, starting now. Despite turning the music up very loud and listening to the rhythm and tapping with my feet, I still find it very difficult to stitch in time. <laughs> and this is important if you want to sew rhythmically, which has always been my ambition, sad though I am. A stitch in time saves nine, but what? We don't know. It could be golden eagles, whales, beavers, fish. I could go on for hopefully a minute on this side, but I won't because... We all know the real meaning of this expression. If one try hello. <laughs> Graham Norton challenge, yes, Graham. Well, the, the broadcast was interrupted. <laughs> <briefly>. <laughs> was it? Interference on the line. Right, hesitation. Fine. You have the subject. A stitch in time, Graham. You have 20 seconds starting now. Some words should never be seen together, such as fun and run. I find there's nothing amusing about that sport, and so I always hope that I will find it too difficult <laughs> to... Uh, Jenny Chan. <laughs> Where well, was that I, going? I, I had to stop you or shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What's your challenge within the rules of just a minute, Jenny? Well, he was going on about... Oh, I don't know. What were we talking about, Graham? Um, Did it have anything to do with the stitch and time? Yeah, yeah, actually, I was about to get to that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So I thought he was deviating no, around the houses. He hadn't, gone a lo he hadn't gone long enough to get to the subject, so he was deviating from the subject, Jenny. So you do have a correct challenge, and you've cleverly got in with three seconds to go. And you start now. A stitch in time saves nine. Well, what's that all about? <laughs> 
Slovenia Claire speaking as the whistle when gained an extra point and has moved forward. She's only two points behind our joint leaders, Tim Rice and Tony Hawkes, and Graham Norton follows one point behind. Tim Rice, your turn to begin. The subject is Mars. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. I'd like to divide my talk on Mars into five parts. First, I would deal with the atmosphere, which is pretty slim. If you're out there on the surface of the red planet, you won't got to get a lot of heavy breathers because there isn't very much air to breathe. Mars is tiny, 4,125 miles in diameter, and two little moons or satellites nip around it regularly. The inner one is called Phobos, the outer... Graham has challenged. I so don't want to know this. <laughs> I could be learning a second language, but there won't be room. Because <laughs> in the of my brain, I know that there's something called Phobos floating around Mars. It is, it, it is a little bit Philistine. like the sky. It is a bit like the sky at night on just a minute, isn't it? <laughs> from that right. distinguished astronomer, Sir Tim Rice. Uh, <laughs> but he wasn't deviating in any way from Mars. And he was absolutely right about his Phobos and others, um, their little satellites out there. So, Tim, an incorrect challenge. Another point to you and Mars. 34 seconds starting now. Not many people know that the Mars bar was actually named after a bloke from America called Mars. You might have thought that it was just a brilliant name, thought up as... Uh, Tony Challenge. I, I'm being very pedantic here, but he said not many people know that, and I think millions of people know that. <laughs> First of all, I don't think millions do know it, and secondly, he was using it as a sort of uh, figure of speech, so I don't think he was really deviating from Can the Can you subject. prove that millions of people don't know it? Though? No, I can't, <laughs> but I don't think it matters in this game whether I have to or not. <laughs> So, Tim, benefit of the doubt, you have uh, Mars. Could 24 seconds still, starting now. I'd like to say what terrific chairmanship we have tonight. We're giving... <laughs> <laughs> Graham Challenge. That has to be some sort of deviation. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you a bonus point, because the audience enjoyed the challenge, but he wasn't deviating from the subject of Mars. 21... Yes, he was! He was <laughs> you! What are you suddenly now? A red planet floating above the Earth? I... You're a man in a chair. <laughs> well, you're in a chair. <laughs> Threw it in again as a figure of speech. He wasn't making it that I was anything to do with Mars. He just commented. Exactly, in... but he's supposed to be talking about Mars. <laughs> Occasionally, I do I bow to the superior wisdom and judgment of the audience, <laughs> and seeing what a, what a, what an aggressive audience they are. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give Be uh, Graham the benefit of the doubt on this occasion and say, Graham, <laughs> you have 21 seconds on Mars, starting now. It must be very difficult to live on Mars, the red planet. One would awake in the morning and think, what to wear that doesn't clash with the place? <laughs> that pink shirt's out for a start. But I wore the black thing yesterday and I haven't had time to wash it and also no water. Uh, Tim, the oh. challenge again. Well, you would have had time to wash it because a day on Mars is considerably longer. <laughs> and I'd just yeah. like to add yeah. that there is water on Mars. There is water, yes. yes. He could wash it, yeah. but he, he said that he wouldn't have the time to wash oh. it. Yes, I was busy. <laughs> Listen, our astronaut... As long as the first. day was, I was busier than that. <laughs> you had the benefit of the doubt last time, Graham. Tim has the benefit of the doubt this time. So three seconds for you, Tim, on Mars. Starting now. Your chairmanship gets even better. But... <laughs> I think we've discussed that before. <laughs> and also, repetition of chairmanship. Graham, another point and one second on Mars, starting now. Mars! <laughs> so Graham Norton, with his erudite comments about Mars has leapt forward in that round. Clearly getting one from the whistle went. He's now just ahead of Tony Hawkes. He's two behind Tim Rice. And Jenny Eclair is in fourth place, and she begins the next round. Jenny, the subject is crying over spilt milk. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. I wouldn't bother crying over spilt milk. Spilt vodka. Oh, I'd weep over that. <laughs> it fell out of my shopping bag and smashed all over my front step. I'd be down there licking it up. <laughs> Uh, the last time I cried over... <laughs> the crap, you challenge. What's the repetition of... <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Graham, 50 seconds on crying over spilt milk, starting now. The last time I cried over spilt milk was in 1974. Oh, I remember it well and hope to tell you about it now if I can just pick out the precise details of the incident. 
I think I was living in a small cottage outside of Cork. Milk was scarce in those days. There was only one cow for the entire community. I had but a thimbleful for my breakfast that morning, I recall. My mother looked at it enviously, but I said, Back off, old woman! It's mine! Then, it must have been karma, I reached to turn off the radio and knocked over the small thimble. It sat the uh, Tony, you challenged. Well, I thought he repeated thimble. <laughs> he did repeat thimble. <laughs> You know, and I'm he absolutely... kept going, he kept going for 46 seconds too. And you got him with four seconds to go with the correct challenge. Crying over spilt milk with Tony starting now. It's no use in crying over spilt milk unless you're being paid by the hour because I can't see the... So, Tony Hawks got the whistle then uh, and got the extra point. He's uh, moved forward, he's one behind our leader Tim Rice and he's equal with Graham Norton. Jenny Clare is only just behind them and Tony, your turn to begin. The subject, daytime TV. So tell us something about it, Tony. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. A few years ago, they attempted to do a daytime TV version of Just a Minute, and it wasn't a complete success. This was largely put down to the fact that Nicholas Parsons is far too handsome for television. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, Jenny Eclair Chan. I made a horrible mistake. I'm so sorry. You don't think I am handsome enough for television? No, I think you're gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, I thought he said television twice, but he's allowed. Because well, it's in the thing, isn't it? Television. No, no. TV's in the... Ah! Oh, so I win. Yes, sir. <laughs> Can I just so say, you, win, you would win if I'd said it twice, but I said daytime TV the first time. He did, I'm afraid, yes. Did he? That's so lovely. close. Okay. Right, so close. So, Jenny, well <laughs> tried. Um, but, Tony, you've still got daytime TV. 46 seconds are starting now. I quite like... Uh, Jenny. Hesitation. Yeah. Tim told me to do that. <laughs> he said... He whispered in my ear. He said, get him on hesitation. <laughs> I meant last time. La <laughs> <laughs> you've got to wait till I hesitate, then do it. Yeah. Yes, he did hesitate the previous time, but it, you can't have retrospective challenges. Uh, uh, so another point to Tony in 45 seconds, daytime TV, starting now. I feel Jenny Eclair wants to get in so much, I'm going to repeat Jenny Eclair and give her a chance. <laughs> and Graham Norton's got in. <laughs> Was there a repetition of Jenny Eclair? <laughs> You're so smart and quick. Oh, yeah. I, I, I thought you'd said it the first time, yes. So, Graham, you got in first, even though Jenny's name is repeated. 39 seconds, starting now. Daytime TV is so educational. Without it, I wouldn't have known how to stencil. I'd have looked at a cushion and not known how to scatter it. Look at a rug, I and I would have said, no, look twice now, but there you yes, go. Yes, Jenny, you've your challenge. What was it? <laughs> He repeated, I would not know. Yes, he did. Of course he did. <laughs> so, I'm well listened, Jenny. You got in there like a flag. <laughs> right, you have 28 seconds on daytime TV starting now. My mother doesn't approve daytime television. She thinks it's morally wrong, which is why my father, even though he's 70, has to watch Hannah Gordon's uh, Watercolor Classroom <laughs> in secret. When you do get in, you don't have to go I've quite so fast. <laughs> Graham, you've got back in again. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there was a gobbledygook. Oh, yeah, gobbledygook hesitation. Over excitement, it, yes. Hannah. Uh, daytime TV is back with you with 21 seconds, Graham, starting now. Thanks to daytime TV, we understand that Americans are fat, angry people. They really don't get on, do they? <laughs> I'm very nervous about traveling to that great country now that I've seen them on daytime TV. Daytime TV features many daytime TV programs. <laughs> <laughs> so Graham Norton, with number of round points in the round, as well as one for speaking the whistle went, has leapt forward and he's now taken the lead. He's one ahead of Tim Rice. <laughs> who's one ahead of Tony Hawks, who is three or four ahead of Jenny Eclair. And it's anybody's <laughs> contest, if you're interested in the contest, but the it's fun not, is my point. I've lost. <laughs> <laughs> But your contribution has been invaluable, and that's what we're here for, my love. Your I'm contribution. So <laughs> the next subject is the minute waltz. And Tim, it's your turn to begin. So will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? The minute waltz is a wonderful piece of music written by Chopin, 
who was very famous for starring in novels about sex and shopping. He was an extremely talented pianist. Not only was he a great composer, he could tickle the ivories like no man. He was... Uh, Tony Challenge. Aren't you supposed to tinkle them? No, he tickled them. He tickled them? Well, what's what's that's the what point of him... tickling a piano? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows pianos aren't it's, tickly. It's up to you to interpret as you wish. You can well, tickle Chopin the ivories. never tickle, tickle the, the piano, ivories. I promise you. <laughs> Or you can pickle the ivories, whatever you want to do with it. No, right. Tim, uh, his, he, he's a master of the spoken word with his great ability with lyrics and so forth. So he's tinkled and you tickled. You live together or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit creepy oh, over there, there, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Tim, you're marvellous. No, you live <laughs> with you. <laughs> I've seen some of the musicals which he's written, and I'm deeply impressed, but, but I, I just, I just like the different phraseology. <laughs> so, an incorrect challenge. Tim, you've still got it, and, um, oh, you've always had it, but I mean, you've still got it. <laughs> They're in love! <laughs> but in this show, you have 44 seconds to tell us more about the Minute Wars, starting now. Every time this program, chaired so wonderfully by Nicholas Parsons, <laughs> is launched on Radio 4, you hear the strains of the Minute Waltz. A superb piece of... Uh, Tony Challenge. I think he said piece of music before. That's right. Uh, you did, I, Tony. I didn't get as far as music. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I would say you had. <laughs> A piece of that. So, Tony, you have... <laughs> So, Tony, you've got him with the correct challenge. 35 seconds. The minute waltz starting now. I tried to play the minute waltz on the piano after initially tickling the keys for a while <laughs> and realising that this was futile. But I'm not a very good pianist, and so it took me 45 minutes to play it, which was disappointing because after 10 or so of these periods of... <laughs> Definite hesitation. It was definite hesitation. He completely <laughs> ran out yes. of what and he was going to say. Subject, he couldn't say anything else, could he? He just completely lost it, didn't he? Do you remember? Yeah. When he, he just kind of ran out of steam, and it was really embarrassing, wasn't it? Oh, God, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> you loved it most of all because you've got in with What's the correct the subject? <laughs> it is the minute waltz. Uh, uh, take a breath. And don't go with too much of a rush. Because you've only got 15 got? seconds. And I think you can do it. The minute waltz, 15 seconds, starting now. The minute waltz. Not to be confused with the minute waltz. A dance for very small people under five foot two. I can't dance with anyone for longer than a minute because I do untold damage that <laughs> Well, uh, Jenny Eclair was speaking. I don't know why someone didn't have her for deviation speaking from her normal mode of speech, but, but anyway, they didn't. Jenny, you kept going. You've obviously got the audience entirely behind you. They'd love you to win, and we're entering the last round. I don't think it's possible. But, um... <laughs> and, Jenny, it is your turn to begin. And the subject is Jane Austen. So tell us something about Jane Austen <laughs> in just a minute, starting now. There was a girl at my school called Jane Austen. Huge beast of a woman. Fat of calf, massive of thigh. Great hockey player. I can see her now. Um, Tim Rice Challenge. Have you got her phone number? <laughs> <laughs> Unusual taste you have, Tim. <laughs> uh, well, we, we enjoyed Tim's uh, um, in, interjection, so we give him a bonus point for that. But Jenny was interrupted, yes, so she was. gets a point for being interrupted and keeps the subject with 51 seconds still available. Jane Austen, Jenny, starting now. Ginger Platts, you should have seen her bully off. Down the wing she'd fly, pigtails streaming behind her in the breeze until she got to the net. The goal where I was, goalie, fat girl, glasses. <laughs> um, Graham Norton challenge. We've had fat and yes, girls. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. I was getting quite upset thinking no, no, about no, it. it. <laughs> <laughs> So, you've got another correct challenge, uh, Graham, and you have 40 seconds to tell us something about Jane Austen, starting now. I get a warm glow when I remember how much I enjoyed Jane Austen's fanny in Mansfield Park. <laughs> it was so entertaining. I picked it up not knowing how much I'd like it, but it really was terrific. <laughs> uh, only I'd been able to let Jane know, but it sometime had elapsed, twixt 
the typing and the reading. <laughs> Jane Austen was quite dirty in that she lived in a bath, apparently. I didn't know till I read some study notes. <laughs> So Graham Norton kept going to the whistle when gained that extra point for doing so, and now I will give you the final situation. Jenny Eclair, who gave such a lovely contribution, such warm, vibrant contribution. Uh, she finished just in fourth place. Not, <laughs> not very far behind Tony Hawks, who was just in third place. He was two points behind Tim Rice, but two points ahead of Tim was Graham Norton, so we say, Graham, you are our winner this week. <laughs> Thank you to our four delightful players of the game, Graham Norton, Jenny Eclair, Tim Rice and Tony Hawks. Also thank Janice Staplehurst for helping me keep the score and for blowing her whistle so elegantly. We're also indebted to the creator of this game, Ian Messiter, and also we thank our producer, Claire Jones, who keeps us all in order whenever she can. And we're indebted to this delightful audience here at the Turner Sims Concert Hall in Southampton who've cheered us on our way. Thank you very much for being such a warm, lovely audience. From you, from the panel, from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in the next time we play Just a Minute. Oh. Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in the United Kingdom, but in Europe, Asia, the Americas, Australasia, and I believe even in Antarctica. But also to welcome to the show this week four highly skilled and experienced exponents of comedy who have joined me tonight. We welcome that master of improvised comedy, Paul Merton, that master of outrageous comedy, Graham Norton, that master of ad-lib comedy, Barry Cryer, and that master of erudite comedy, Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> and as usual... I am going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score, and she'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the radio theatre in the centre of Broadcasting House. And before us, we have a fine cosmopolitan audience drawn from all parts of the greater metropolis here of London. And we're going to begin the show this week with Paul Merton. And Paul, the subject is name dropping. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. I hate name dropping, and funnily enough, so does Princess Margaret. Like me, she thinks it's a vulgar, horrible habit. Mel Gibson's very much the same. And you'll find that there are a number of people, like Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice, the Queen, Princess Andrew. Oh, no. <laughs> Graham Norton, you challenged. Uh, two princesses. Mm. Yes, there were two princesses. Yeah, I forgot about that. And mm. Princess Andrew, I thought. Princess have you not heard? <laughs> have you not heard the news? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Where was the operation? <laughs> <laughs> well, my goodness me. Yes. Uh, uh, Graham, a correct challenge. So you get a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject, which is name-dropping, and you have 44 seconds starting now. My career at the garden centre was a short and unhappy one. I was given a large pile of garden names to... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Two gardens. Mm. Yes. That's correct. <laughs> Gardens, not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Clement, a correct challenge, a point to you. You have the subject name-dropping. 37 seconds available starting now. I quite like geographical name-dropping. New York, Delhi, New Orleans, <laughs> two news. Uh... <laughs> Paul, you were the first to challenge. There was two news. There were two news and the audience spot as well, so they all plotted together. Right. 31 seconds still available for you. Back with name dropping starting now. Anthony Wedgwood Ben dropped several parts of his name many years ago. He is now, of course, known as Tony, the name I mentioned earlier. <laughs> and he did this. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of name. Yes. Oh. Yes, indeed. So, Paul, oh. another correct challenge. Another point to Clement. 21 seconds now. Name dropping Clement starting now. Monopoly is really all about name dropping. 
Park Lane, Mayfair, Piccadilly, Regent Street, <laughs> Street uh, Paul Challenge. A repetition of Street. Yes. <laughs> it's impossible, isn't it? Paul, you have name dropping back again. You have another point and have 14 seconds starting now. Nicholas was telling me just before the show that somebody has registered my name on the internet as paulmerton.com. It isn't me, it's somebody else. But what I can do is I can claim my own nomenclature back if I contact this company. <laughs> Whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Paul Merton who has the most points at the end of that round. Clement Freud has two, Graham Norton has one. That is yet to get any, but we have heard from him. <laughs> but not... apologise for hogging the game. And that's right. <laughs> Clement Freud, will you take the next round? The subject, very apt for London, Big Ben. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. In Who Wants to Be a Millionaire for £100, you are likely to get a question... Is Big Ben tiny Tim? Um, Barry Crouch. That was me, I was wrong. It was repetition of what is on the card. No, it's hesitation. Was it? Yes. Oh, that's what I meant. <laughs> Sorry. I had an impediment in my challenge. No. Sorry. <laughs> hesitation, that's what I meant. Absolutely, to say. yes, because you haven't played as much as the others. Right. Uh, Barry, Barry is well spotted. Um, <laughs> And you have a point for a correct challenge, and you have 52 seconds. Tell us something about Big Ben, starting now. I was under the impression that Big Ben was the name of the bell, not the clock. But regardless of that, it's a very symbol of our nation. To me, Big Ben is Ben Travers, a master farceur, author of plays that ran at the Oldwich Theatre many years ago, starring stars of the... Na -na man <laughs> Graham, you challenge first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Repetition yeah. of them. Yum. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nyam, nyam. Uh, Graham, you have yes. a correct challenge. And you have Was this? Yes. yes. I thought that might have been a word. I yes. might have been very wrong there. No, no, no. no. You have... Uh, it was uh, hesitation because it was right. a stumble, and we interpret that as hesitation. Uh, 34 seconds are available for you. Tell us something about Big Ben starting now. Big Ben is one of my happiest memories from my first trip to London. I often wonder what became of him. At the time, he was a waiter in Crouch End. We corresponded for a while and then nothing. Typical. If Big Ben is listening now, do get in touch. It'd be lovely to see you because I'm sure you're old and time is our friend. And I'm sure you're rather wizened now, Ben. Um, Clement Freud challenge. Two shores. Yes. And a little bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, you, you've got him with six seconds to go on Big Ben, starting now. You can look at it and nearly always get the correct time. Graham, you challenged. He stopped. I knew he did. <laughs> I did six seconds. You didn't. You only did four seconds. That's right. I timed this on Big Ben. <laughs> yes, uh, no, no. We worked a Big Ben time, and uh, you did four seconds. And there's two seconds still available for you, Graham, <laughs> with another correct challenge starting now. Big Ben. And Port Clement challenge. Hesitation. No. Oh. <laughs> the crowd has <laughs> spoken. Right. Raw. Only half a second. You've got one and a half seconds on Big Ben, Graham, starting now. Big Ben oh. is not the name of the So Graham Norton's plea from the heart got him points because he was interrupted. And he also got one for speaking as the whistle went. So he has moved into the lead at the end of that round. And Barry Cryer... How am I doing, Nick? You're doing well. <laughs> you're doing well. You've got one point. And, um, and you'll take the next when round. When was that? <laughs> when you challenged for hesitation. Oh, yes, that that's right. challenge of yours. I owe you. Right. You're right. You have the, uh, my obsession now, which is a subject, and you begin with it, and you start now. I feel the shade of Victor Meldrew over me. My obsessions are aversions, paper clips that intertwine and enmesh with each other when you leave them in a drawer, wire coat hangers abhorred by Joan Crawford, the sticky tape whose name rhymes with hello that has no beginning and no end and wraps round your fingers. You have no idea where it's going. Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. Three no's. There were two no's, uh, three what? no's actually. No beginning, no end. Really? Yes. I, I must listen when I talk. Okay, yes. <laughs> so, Clement, you've got in with 30 second, 37 seconds on my obsession starting now. My obsession is disliking people who wear Dr. Shaw or any other therapeutic sandal. I do feel if someone has 
something wrong with their feet. It ought to be personal between them and the things at the bottom of their legs. <laughs> Restaurant waiters and waitresses occasionally are shod in this sort of gear, and I dislike it enormously. It is my obsession to call the manager and complain. I shall not eat oxtail with... <laughs> Barry, you challenged. Hesitation, may yes, I venture? Yes, yes. May you, I venture? you ventured correctly. He did hesitate. And you got him with five seconds to go on my obsession starting now. Speaking earlier of those triangular objects on which you hang your clothes in a wardrobe. Uh, poor Burton Chan. No. Did he say did he say hang before? I said no, hangers. hangers. Hangers before. Oh, did he really? Hangers. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, I was just wondering to myself, really. <laughs> <laughs> you were just musing. I was musing. 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 Yeah, musing wrongly. But, uh, Barry, you've had a wrong challenge, so you've got another point. And you have one second left on my obsession starting now. My obsession that overrode. <laughs> so, Barry Cryer, with points in that round, including one for speaking as a whistle went, has truly leapt forward, and you are now in second place, Barry. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're one behind Graham Norton, who's still in the lead. And you're one ahead of Paul Merton and Clement Freud, who are equal in third place. This cannot be. <laughs> Graham Norton, your turn yes. to begin. The subject right. is the common cold. Will you tell us something about it in this game, starting now? Each winter I dread getting the common cold. I long for a sophisticated infection, or perhaps an exotic <laughs> flu, because that's the sort of thing you can cure in a fun way. The common cold is presumably cured by common things like boiled meat and white bread. Ugh, I say. I went to the doctor once. His name was Dr. Michaels. Uh, oh. Paul Merton Challenge. Two doctors. Two doctors, Sam, yes. Oh. There was only one doctor there. <laughs> Yeah, but you said it twice. Paul, you've got in with 36 seconds on the common cold starting now. Well, famously, it's one of those things they still can't cure, despite the fact somewhere out in Shropshire or Lancashire, some such place, they infect people with the common cold virus every winter to see if they can cure them of it. Uh, Graham Norton Challenge. Repetition of cure? Oh, my yes, goodness. the common cure. Oh, yes. I could be wrong. No, you're quite right. Mm. You're quite right. You could actually have had for deviation, because after 35 years... They actually closed the place down. Did they? they couldn't find a cure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've not been following the story as closely as you, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tell you, people were invited to have a holiday there, and they were given a holiday in these chalets, given the cold, and how to enjoy themselves in like a, sort of like a leisure centre with a cold. And that was their holiday. And they got a cold, and that <laughs> didn't cost them a penny. And it shut down, you say? <laughs> Because they couldn't cure it. There's so many different strains and so many different reasons and so many different emotional reasons why the common cold is induced. Right. Emotional reasons? Emotional no. reasons. <laughs> yes, emotional. If you're, if you're sometimes very distressed, sometimes you <laughs> induce a cold within yourself. Nurse, nurse, he's out of bed again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those with psychological knowledge might appreciate what I've just been saying, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. Who so challenged? It was a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, cure. Who was it? Me. You, Graham. right. Graham. <laughs> 24 seconds, the common cold starting now. A lot of people don't realise there are so many strains of the common cold, and you catch it for many reasons, including emotional, psychological... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Barry Crowd Challenge. Repetition of many. There were too many's. But still, I was, I was very interesting, wasn't I, Nicholas? Yes. I, was saying, I, was, really I was saying really interesting things, I wanted I? you to go on. It yes. was so yes. interesting, yes. I, everything I was saying was very true. Yes. I, I feel a churl for interrupting <laughs> you, Graham. But you've got 70, another point, Barry, in 17 seconds, a common cold starting now. As I speak or try to, my proboscis is akin to a tap. My body is the wrong way round, my feet smell and my uh, nose uh, run. Clement Floyd challenge. Three mice. Mice. My Did feet? I do a lot of mice yes, there? Yes, my feet, my proboscis. Oh, my, my, my goodness. <laughs> right. Ten seconds, the common cold, Clement, <laughs> starting now. The common cold is a pretty down-market disease. Influenza is the sort of thing... Uh, Paul Burton Charles. Is the, is, the, is the common cold a disease? Yes. Well, I don't know I what's don't a disease, disease and what's an illness. I think it's, I think it's like... It's, I don't think it's a disease... Well, I don't know, because some people call it a disease, some call it an illness, I would call Which it an illness. Which one's right, though, Nicholas? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, you know everything about the common cold. <laughs> uh, 
Not it was in sad well, place clothes down. <laughs> I tell you what I'm going to do. It's one of those lovely occasions when I'm going to put it to the wisdom of our superior wisdom of our audience. God. So if you agree with Paul's <laughs> challenge that it is not a disease but an illness, you cheer for him. And if you disagree, then ailment. you all boo for him and you all do it together now. Boo. <laughs> It's an illness. <laughs> and you win, Paul. And you have uh, four seconds on the common cold starting now. Coughs and sneezes spread diseases was one of the things they used to say in the war. <laughs> Paul Martin speaking as the whistle when gained that extra point. He's now taken the lead again ahead of Graham Norton and Barry Crown, Clement Freud in that order. And Paul, your turn to begin. And the subject is, if walls had ears... Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Well, clearly I blame the architect. Something's gone wrong there in the <laughs> blueprint. It's like having a mouth on your front door. And who amongst us here would not want to have an oral cavity on our portal? It would be very useful to tell the postman whether you're in or out. It would be a wonderful... It would be... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Three woods. Woods, yes. It would, you would, you would. And, Clement, you've got him with 46 seconds. If walls had ears, starting now. If walls had ears, why on earth do they go on making ice cream? That's what I would like to know. not new challenge first. I, 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 maybe I... Were you still muttering quietly? I, could, I thought you'd stop. 39 seconds for you, Graham, on If Walls Had Ears, starting now. If walls had ears, paintings would be so much easier to hang. However, the downside of that is that cleaning would be such a chore. Oh, you could dust the dado rail to your heart's content, but then out would come the Q-tips, and you'd be up and down on a ladder, varicose veins throbbing, going through them, double-heading. It would be hell, I feel, if walls had ears. Therefore, I say, let's stick with nails and hammers for... Uh, Clement Floyd Challenge. We've had nails before. Did I say nails? No. <laughs> no. Oh, maybe we did, Clement. No, he didn't, because you said it would be so much easier to hang them. You didn't say hung. Well, I'm against hanging as well. <laughs> An incorrect challenge, Graham, so you still have nine seconds on If Walls Had Ears, starting now. If Walls Had Ears, I wouldn't have to spend so much of my time with a big glass pressed against the wall of my neighbour's house. Ooh, their fights are fantastic. So Graham Norton, with his walls having ears, gained a number of points in the round, including one for speaking as the whistle went, and he has moved forward. He's now in the lead ahead of Paul Merton. And Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject, keeping a diary. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. I think I'd stick to Friesians, because they do give by far the best. <laughs> Paul, you challenge. Dyslexia. <laughs> 55 seconds, keeping a diary starting now. I started to keep a diary when I was about 15 years old. It was full of the usual stuff that you write when you're that sort of age. Um, was that age twice? <laughs> <laughs> Grand challenge. The M. Oh, it um, seemed to be hesitation. Yes, it was hesitation. 47 seconds. Cl uh, Graham, tell us something about keeping a diary starting now. The only diary I ever kept was when I was on a foreign exchange trip in France in 1987. Before I went, I think I'd read a little too much Jane Austen. Therefore, it was full of expressions like suffice to say <laughs> and needless to add. I... Uh, Barry Crouch. I know two's a little word, but there are a lot of them. It was right, yes. <laughs> you haven't won... <laughs> Panto's come early. <laughs> you haven't won many friends with that challenge, No, I Barry. know. But it is a correct one, and when the rules are just a minute, you are entitled to have it. So, um, you have the subject. You have 30 seconds. Keeping a diary, starting now. On the subject of keeping a diary, May West, that great oracle, uttered the wonderful remark, keep a diary and it will also the same word, you. <laughs> Famous... <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that. Paul, you challenged. Uh, hesitation, Yes, there was yes, a hesitation, yes. yes. Uh, you waited for the big laugh, but it didn't unfortunately happen. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure you know that sensation. <laughs> <laughs> He's been waiting for one laugh since 1948. 
I set myself up for it, but therefore that's what it's all about. 18 seconds for you, Paul, keeping a diary starting now. Unfortunately, when I looked back on it a few years later, I realised it was full of very trite, banal observations, not really worth sharing with myself at all. This is, of course, the problem when you decide to keep a diary, is that your thoughts aren't at all interesting to you or anybody else. Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and he has retaken the lead, one ahead of Graham Norton, and they're both a few points ahead of Barry Crow and Clement Freud in that order, and Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject, chairing a panel game. I'm very nervous of this subject. <laughs> you have 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Apparently the Russians have trained a baboon. It didn't take very long, <laughs> that four or five months, and it took to it very well indeed. Very pleasant little chap. There's an orangutan in Norway that hosts a show who's a great favourite with the crowd. It seems it doesn't take any particular skill, charisma, <laughs> talent whatsoever. But then, of course, we look at our esteemed chairman, Nicholas Parsons, and we realise that all of the above is true. He's a <laughs> wonderful chairman. I've said chairman three times now. <laughs> you were being so insulted, they just let you go on, you see. <laughs> so, Clement, you challenged. He repeated chairman. He did times, indeed yeah. repeat. No, yes, because chairman's not in the car, chairing is... So, Clement, will you talk on the subject of chairing a panel game? 32 seconds, starting now. There are six people in front of the audience, and I wonder who would be useful at chairing a panel game. Looking around... <laughs> Paul, you challenged. Well, he was trying to do two senses at the same time, looking and talking, and the talking <laughs> stopped. That's right. Hesitation. And he looked and paused, and you picked it up first. Hesitation. And you tried 23 seconds. I wish you hadn't got it to get back again, because after what you've just said, but carry on. Cheering a panel game, starting now. There's a mongoose in Montreal that's done <laughs> a marvellous job, and everybody flocks to these shows and says, well, it's absolutely wonderful that these creatures from the animal kingdom can be trained up in this marvellous... Uh, Graham Norton. Mm, I might be wrong. Mm, I be. might be wrong, if I think I am. Uh, I, I was going to say repetition of trained. Yes, I think... But you trained up, you see. Trained up might be a word. No, it mm. isn't. It's two words. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and there are 11 seconds. Chairing a panel game, uh, Graham, starting now. Who could realise how difficult it is to chair a panel game until you see our esteemed chair, Nicholas Parsons, doing it, making fabulous decisions like giving it to me? Thank you uh, for redressing the balance there, Graham. And you only got one point. I think he was being sarcastic. <laughs> 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 well, don't worry, because next time you're on the show, we're going to have a baboon here to be in this gym <laughs> and see how many points you get then. <laughs> you well, I'm willing to give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Should we put it to the audience? <laughs> I don't know. I can't win at this, can I? But anyway, Graham Norton, speaking as well, you've got an extra point. You move forward, you're just three <laughs> points behind Paul Merton, who's still in the lead, and Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is a good hand. Tell us something about a good hand in this game starting now. If you have a good hand, you could go in for the transatlantic single-handed race, which I've always wondered why lots of people don't compete in. At Bridge, which is a card game, a good hand would consist of an ace, king, queen, jack, ten, and eight other cards of the same suit, which would enable you... Uh, Barry Crouch. I, I, I'm very wary. Well, I think there was, a, there was a hesitation there. No, the I, don't the so. I don't think so. I don't think so. No. No, 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 no. I no. Don't think so. He got very close to it. <laughs> yes. Sort of teetering on it, but didn't quite... I played King did. Rat in pantomime no, this no, no, year. No, no. I think it's rubbing off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean, but anyway... Uh... I believe that, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> 37 seconds, another point to you, Clement. A good hand starting now. A good hand is likely to be either your left or right, <laughs> with five fingers and nails attached. Manicurists will tell you all about it because they use buffers and drills. And uh, Paul Charles. Drills? drills. <laughs> Manicurists use drills on your hands? They yeah. are actually little drills, but they buff the drills actually with the buffing. It's more of a, that's like a buffer rather than a drill. Yeah, yeah but it, it, Wait it, for it. It's, it, it's a drill. It. It's just a drill that buffs. I disagree with your challenge, Paul. Okay. And Clement <laughs> has another point. And 24 seconds on a good hand starting now. If you've been dealt a good hand by God or whoever is above, 
then everything is terrifically well for you. The sun shines, your wife is faithful, children bring home really nice people for dinner who use knives and forks and spoons where others just deploy their hands to shovel Grant Graham Norton challenge. Oh, no, no, very bad thing, very bad thing. Uh, I was going, I, I heard hand and I'd forgotten yeah. what the subject was mm-hmm. and, oh, deviation. It must have been deviating if I'd forgotten what the subject was. <laughs> Okay, I'm clutching at straws, but still. I think you are, because I think he was talking about the good hand that God had dealt this person, and he was illustrating it, I think, quite coherently. And uh, so, once again, Clement has the benefit of the doubt. Next time, you might have the benefit. And it's three seconds with you still, Clement, a good hand starting now. In the United States, a farm labourer might be called a good hand. So Clement Floyd is speaking as a whistle went and gained that extra point as well as others in the round. He's moved forward, but he's still in third place. And we're moving into the final round. So let me give you the score as we do. Uh, Paul Merton's still in the lead, just ahead of Graham Norton, who's just ahead of Clement Floyd, who's uh, just ahead of Barry Cryer, in that order. But there's a few points separating first and last. And uh, this is the last round, as I said before. <laughs> Graham, it is your turn to begin. All right. Don't be inhibited, Barry, because it's the, it's the contribution that's important, not the point. Do you patronise as a hobby, or is it a living? <laughs> no, I never patronise. I just like to give out warmth and love and affection to people who are talented. Right. Well, give me some as well. <laughs> right. Graham, take yes. the last round. It is power dressing. I don't know whether you've done any of it yourself, but talk about it in this game starting now. My mother loved power dressing. She would simply pour some battery acid over lettuce and scallions and beetroot and egg and say, look, darlings, it's power dressing. The great boon of this disgusting dish was that the lazy cow didn't have to make any pudding. That's the sort of upbringing I had. Yes, we'd all lie there kind of groaning over the power dressing, Nothing on television would distract us from the extreme pain in our stomachs. (laughs) Flick as we might through RTE 1 and 2. Yes, both channels available in full colour in our home. But the power dressing in the bottom of the bowl would often be drained back into something that could power something else, like a radio or car. Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. Two somethings. Clement was a correct challenge. And he has 14 and a half seconds on power dressing starting now. A vinaigrette fashioned of garlic, puri, chili, peppercorn. Ball challenge. There's a, there's a paragraph between each one of those. There's hesitation. <laughs> Definite hesitation. Paul, you've got him with a correct challenge. With nine seconds, power dressing starting now. This is something that Joan Collins did very much in her heyday in the 1980s. She would appear in these American soap operas with these massive, great shoulder pads. <laughs> So Paul Merton speaking as the whistle when gained that extra point. Um, and now just to give you the final situation, um, Barry Cryer came <laughs> with his usual style and aplomb, but he only finished just in fourth place, just behind Clement Freud, who was a few points behind Graham Norton, who was a few points even more behind Paul Merton. He has most points this week, so we say, Paul, you're the winner this week. <laughs> It only remains for me to say thank you to these four delightful and outstanding players of the game, Graham Norton, Barry Cryer, Clement Freud, and Paul Merton. And also thank Janice Staplehurst for keeping the score so cleverly for us and blowing her whistle when the 60 seconds was up. And we thank Claire Jones, our producer-director, who tries to keep the situation in order and get a control of it when she possibly can. And we're indebted to Ian Messiter, who thought of the game, which we all enjoy playing so much. And we are grateful to this audience here in the Radio Theatre in London for cheering us on our way. From our audience, from our panel, from me, Nicholas Parsons, thank you for tuning in. Be with us the next time we play. Just a minute. Until then, goodbye. Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is...
Miss Nicholas Parsons. And as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world and, of course, particularly in this country of Great Britain. And also it's a great pleasure to welcome four exciting and experienced players of the game. We welcome back the outrageous leprechaun of television comedy, Graham Norton. <laughs> The flamboyant mistress of stand-up comedy, Jenny Eclair. The irrepressible exponent of improvised comedy, Tony Hawkes. And the master of the lyric phrase and West End musicals, Tim Rice. Would you please welcome all four of them? And as usual, I am going to ask them to speak, if they can, on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep a score, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Turner Sims Concert Hall, which is part of the University of Southampton. And we have a delightful audience <laughs> of Soton people and further afield, and of course students, who are going to cheer us on our way as we begin the show with Graham Norton. Graham, the subject, very aptly, is my philosophy of life. Tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now. My philosophy of life is a simple one. Whenever you're feeling down and depressed, just remember that a problem shared is gossip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> something bad happens to you, you're bringing joy to literally hundreds of people. <laughs> you break a leg, 15 people love heartily. You... Oh, well, Jenny Eclair, you pressed your buzzer. I did, only yeah. because he said people twice. He did say people mm. twice. Yeah. No, yes. yep, yep, yep. Very good. Very good. And it was a correct challenge, Jenny. I'm so glad. Yes. And you get a point for a correct challenge. And you take over the subject. And there are 38 seconds available. Tell us something about my philosophy of life starting now. My philosophy of life is to whistle. Even if it doesn't cheer you up, it'll irritate everybody else. <laughs> ah! Eat, drink and be merry. And Tim Rice has challenged. Repetition of ha. Ha, 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 ha. No, she didn't say ha. Ha. No, 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 it was, a single, it was a single monosyllabic type of laugh. I'm good at monosyllabic. <laughs> so, Jenny, an incorrect challenge. You keep the subject. You know, the point for an incorrect challenge. 30 seconds still available. My philosophy of life starting now. And if you're feeling a little low, get a lager out of the fridge, nice and chilled. Or three. What else can you do? Shop. Go shopping. Oh, isn't it marvellous uh, shopping? Tim, uh, right. I thought there was a hesitation there. No, you should stutter, shop and then go actually. shopping. A stutter. <laughs> Just because I have a stutter. Oh, so I, oh. <laughs> I withdraw it completely. No, 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 I Tim, we like, we like people who are keen. We like keenness. But Jenny didn't uh, deviate. She didn't hesitate. She has 22 seconds still, <laughs> with another point, of course. <laughs> My philosophy of life starting now. Retail therapy is a lot more effective than chucking huge sums of money at a shrink. There's not much in life that can't be put right by a new pair of kitten heels, especially if you're a woman. Um... <laughs> Graham Norton, new challenge. Oh, did hesitate a bit. The one that hesitated. I After ran out of steam love. Yeah. I ran out of personality. That's me done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Graham, correct challenge. A point to you. You've got the subject back. My philosophy of life. Ten seconds starting now. My philosophy of life is I think, <laughs> therefore, I must still be sober. And I must do something about that. Tony Chunge. Did he have a different philosophy of life when he first spoke? He did he have a different a... philosophy and of I, life. I wonder whether it, you, but, you... but he could have a multi uh, faceted multi philosophy of life. So. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not my philosophies of life, it's you my... Know, I changed my philosophy <laughs> of life. <laughs> Listening to Jenny, I was musing. <laughs> uh, you I know think... what? I'm changing my philosophy of life. If you've got a full minute to do uh, it in, uh, why not? Exactly. <laughs> and I think if you have a philosophy of life, it can embrace a number of different attitudes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you have another point, uh, Graham, and you have five seconds. My philosophy of life starting now. My philosophy of life is a constantly evolving thing. <laughs> In this game, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. And this occasion it was Graham Norton, who has a strong lead at the end of the first round. Closely followed by Jenny Eclair. And Jenny, you take the next round. Right. The subject is sushi. Tell us something about sushi in just a minute, starting now. Oh, how fashionable. You eat it with chopsticks. The only cutlery I feel you can wear in your hair successfully. <laughs> it's raw fish wrapped up in seaweed, or as the Japanese call it, nori. 
Apparently, it's an art form constructing sushi, a bit like making savoury licorice all sorts. You need rice, um... <laughs> Tim, you've challenged. Hesitated on rice. Yes, you sort of the rice. <laughs> So, Tim, a correct challenge, a point, and 39 seconds available. Tell us something about sushi, starting now. I went into a Japanese restaurant recently and was greeted, Ah, so, said the man at the door, and I was extremely impressed by his friendliness as he directed me towards a delicious bowl of sushi. I have not eaten this wonderful Japanese dish. <coughs> uh, Graham Norton challenge. Oh, there were two Japanese. Yes, a Japanese restaurant. I no. wasn't the only person in the restaurant. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, a correct challenge, a point, and sushi is with you. 23 seconds, starting now. Sushi is a sort of anti-food. Yes, they killed it, but then felt so guilty they didn't want to cook it. <laughs> Leave the poor fish alone, it suffered enough. And then you have to sit there with it. Oh, it's revolting. I'll go further. It's wrong. There's something deeply disturbing about food that has gone prepared. Oh, just a minute. Before oh. the whistle went, Tony challenged. Uh, repetition of food. Yes, I'm afraid you mentioned food before. Oh. And Fair enough, challenged. Tony. Yes. <laughs> oh, hang on. And I'm afraid it's not that easy. Prepared. I've got to keep going for a full second I now. Know. <laughs> it's half a second, actually. Oh. Your challenge did come in before the whistle went. Half a second, Sushi, with you, Tony, starting now. My philosophy of life. <laughs> So, Tony Hawk's got the point for speaking as the whistle went, and he's now equal with Jenny Clare in second place behind Graham Norton. Tim Rice, your turn to begin. The subject, skating on thin ice. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. Skating on thin ice, that is my philosophy. I believe in living close to the cutting hedge. And also, <laughs> I'm extremely bold, a gambler, a man who will risk anything which is meant by the phrase skating on thin ice. How important it is to zoom and flow gracefully across the frozen water. Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. He's overestimating how important it is. <laughs> it's not important at all to zoom or flow across the water. In fact, it's silly to zoom across the water. So, are you saying it's deviation because skating on thin ice is a very delicate balance? Well, frankly, balance. he was it's... skating on thin ice all the way through there. <laughs> <laughs> was there I a deviation then? Oh, well, it's a very difficult one on which to judge, but I will give the benefit of the doubt to, say, to Tim and say he did illustrate that he was skating on thin ice even though he was going with some style and panache. So. Don't go too far, Tim. Benefit of the doubt to you. 34 seconds, skating on thin ice, starting now. Coupled with my skating on thin ice is style and panache. This is... <laughs> Jenny, challenge. That's two panaches. You, uh, you can have too much panache. No, I have panache. You it's said panache. panache. Yes. Uh... <laughs> you started him off. <laughs> Jenny, I, is, you, you listen very well, but you weren't looking at the who was speaking. I got the wrong blow. You got the wrong blow. You're uh, both old. I know that. <laughs> You've lost an awful lot of brownie points there. <laughs> You've gained some friends in the audience. God knows why they clap. I don't know. No, I wonder is. if Jenny will win now. <laughs> so an incorrect challenge. 29 seconds with you, Tim, still skating on thin ice, starting now. Women sometimes skate on thin ice when they accuse a man of being older than he really is. <laughs> this is disgraceful and rude, but it's not really worth the risk because things can turn viciously against the female in question. Uh, Jenny challenged. He hesitated. Yes, he did hesitate. Fifteen seconds, skating on thin ice, Jenny, starting now. I prefer to skate on thick ice at Stretham Ice Rink, where it's thermostatically controlled. Round the rink I zoom. Uh, Tony challenged. Deviation. We want to hear about her skating on thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was deviation, Tony. You have the subject. You have nine seconds. Skating on thin ice, starting now. I'm not remotely interested in skating on thin ice, however... Uh, Tim Rice challenge. Well, I mean, he's given himself away, hasn't he? He's <laughs> he may not remotely interested, but he'll still talk on the subject, you see. I doubt it. He spent no. eight of nine seconds saying he was not interested. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he 
he, had a lot, he spent three and a half he seconds. He had a lot actually. to cram into those last two or three seconds if he was going to retrieve himself. Mm -hmm. Yes, a, a good point, but I don't Very agree good with it. Point. Uh, <laughs> so, Tony, you have an incorrect challenge, and you have five seconds still skating on thin ice starting now. I was at Streatham Ice Rink not long ago and saw Tim Wright zooming. <laughs> Tony Hawk, speaking as the whistle went again, the next extra point, and with other points in the round, has moved forward. He's taken the lead now, just ahead of Graham Norton, and then Jenny Eclair and Tim Rice in that order. And Tony, your turn to begin, and we are in Southampton, that illustrious city here with its famous docks, but not far away is the New Forest. Tell us something about it in just a minute, starting now. I think that the New Forest is so much more preferable to the old one, which used to be there, which didn't have self-raking leaves or computerized wild horses as the present forest has. I believe historically that William the Conqueror... Uh, Tim challenge. I think we had two I believes. Yes, mm. we did, yes. Could, could well have Well, listen, I... Tim, you have 43 seconds. You tell us something about the New Forest starting now. I'm very interested to know exactly when the New Forest got going and the lads at the time said let's call this the New Forest not thinking that it would still be around in the year 2001 when it ought really now to be called at least the fairly middle-aged forest. <laughs> Something that Jenny Eclair would get rather worked up about. <laughs> but it's still called the New Forest and I think we should respect it for that nomen... Uh, Jenny Challenge. He did say call twice. Called and called. You might say it three times. <laughs> Keep saying it every other word. Called, called, called. <laughs> he repeated call. He did? Yes. 19 seconds, the new forest starting now. They do have ponies that look like John Bon Jovi with long fringes dangling into their liquid brown eyes. <laughs> How I would like to take one of them little horses home with me and feed it straw, green apples and other equine treats. I don't know much about the green, the green forest. <laughs> But it is green, it is green. Yes, it is very green, yes. Tim got in first. Tim, shun. Total collapse. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hesitation, that's all. Five seconds, Tim. The New Forest, starting now. The New Forest is home to so many wonderful examples of wildlife. Tim was speaking as the whistle went, and with other points than round his left, he's now equal in the lead with Tony Hawks. Graham Norton, your turn to begin. The subject, the problem page. Tell us something about the problem page. <laughs> already laughing. You talk on that subject in this game starting now. When I was a teenager, problems were so much worse than they are today. Now you just write to dear Deirdre or some such lone person. Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. Well, deviation, if you write to dear Deirdre, you'd have to write dear, dear Deirdre. <laughs> <laughs> have been using as a form of endearment and saying you could write to dear Deirdre, <laughs> even though people do talk about people in that sense that way, don't they? 48 seconds, the problem page still with you, Graham, starting now. The problem page in any book is one that is stuck to the next one. Ooh, you think? I can't Oh, sorry, it out Tim has challenged. Tim, uh, two ones. There were two ones there, yes. Oh, that's such a small word, Tim. In, I know. <laughs> But in just it hardly minute. seems worrying about, does it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's correct in just a minute, so Tim, you have a correct challenge. And 40 seconds, the problem page, starting now. You've all heard of good King Wenceslas and his brave, sweet young page that trod in the footsteps every sod which the saint had printed. What is not so well known is that the previous occupant of this post was a real rotter of a page. He was a real problem page. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tony, challenge. Uh, repetition of real. Yes, a real, a real rotter, rotter and a real yes, problem. Real. It's quite long vowels in that one and everything. <laughs> <laughs> very, oh, very word. good challenge, Tony. Oh, the, 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 good, good the challenge. aggro setting in, right, here we go. But a correct a challenge to Tony. 24 seconds, the problem page, Tony, starting now. I used to write a problem page in a magazine in which I outlined all my problems and people wrote in and suggested what I could do <laughs> about getting them right. And I had some wonderful letters, I have to say. There was a woman from Colchester who suggested that I got out more. <laughs> and this is what I did. And I went to the town where she lived and pulled all the flowers out of her front. <laughs> so, Tony Hawk, speaking as a whistle, went gained that extra point and has uh, 
had gone into the lead ahead of Tim Rice and then Graham Norton and Jenny Clare in that order. And Jenny, your turn to begin. Another phrase for you this time. Flying off the handle. Starting now. I'm good at this. I like to do it every day. The only form of exercise I ever get. Oh, it's a very good aerobic workout. Stomping up and down the stairs, slamming doors, biting carpets. I'm very easily wound up. All anyone needs to say to me is, have you put on weight and then watch me go like a mad exercise missile on heat? <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you challenge first. Re hesitation. It was a bit of 40 a seconds. Yeah. Flying off the handle, starting now. Flying off the handle is something I hardly ever do. If somebody insults me by saying I look old or tired, <laughs> I accept it very, very... Ah! <laughs> it's a tough game. Tony, you got in first. Very, very... 31 seconds. Flying off the handle, starting now. I saw a wasp on a teapot once, and it was on the spout, but I thought it's only a question of time before it moves around and flies off the handle. <laughs> and I watched it for about two hours, and this didn't happen, and I was a little upset, because I like... Graham Norton challenged. Well, he did sort of stop. He hesitated. 16 seconds. A correct challenge to you, Graham. Flying off the handle, starting now. My career as an air steward was a happy but brief one. <laughs> it didn't go that well in the cockpit when I discovered there was an amusing switch to play with and I got frightened and did sojourn with the thing. <laughs> So, uh, Graham Norton, speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point, and others, he's now equal with Tim Rice. They're just two behind Tony Hawks. Tim Rice, metaphors. A man who's written many words into many lyrics. Talk about metaphors in this game, starting now. I never use metaphors. I would s. <laughs> <laughs> Graham challenge. What was that? <laughs> He eschews metaphors to the extent they couldn't talk about it. <laughs> <coughs> so you came in first, Graham. Uh, hesitation. Metaphors with you. And 56 seconds starting now. You have nice hair is a metaphor for a sweet God in heaven. You're really ugly. Uh, Tony Challenge. No, it's a euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid he's right, uh, Graham. Can you say to the audience, stop pretending to be clever now. <laughs> You'd no idea you were going along with it till he told you. <laughs> and you go, oh, yeah, stupid yeah. Irish man, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, 51 seconds, metaphor starting now. I see that what lies ahead of me in this minute is a long stretch of road with bandits by the side of it waiting to pounce with their buzzers. We'll get hawks. That would be an example of a metaphor. But I can do many more and probably will if I can think of any, which I shall. <laughs> For instance, ships in the night, two of us meeting. Oh, yes, with steam coming. Uh, Tim Rice Challenge. Well, I thought he needed rescue, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't metaphors, it was a string of cliches. Uh. <laughs> I, I think he was straying into the world of cliché, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, Tim. 25 seconds, metaphors starting now. Metaphors, an extremely difficult subject, and I want the audience to concentrate and follow very carefully. I'm going to divide my talk this evening into at least five or six parts, and we'll start with meta twos, go on to meta threes, and finally get to meta fours. <laughs> this is an extremely important... Uh, Tony Challenge. Uh, repetition of meta. <laughs> It's part of the word on the card. No, it's not. Meta twos and Me meta threes. And meta, me they, they're, Are yes, they? Uh, meta they fours. And meta's come out. What is a, a meta two, then, by the way? <laughs> I don't know. Ask Tim Rice. See who created it. Tim, well, I give you the benefit of the doubt again, and you have uh, <laughs> nine seconds. Metaphors starting now. This is such a gripping topic. I don't know where to begin to address. <laughs> uh, Graham Challenge. I just stopped him. <laughs> What is this anti-rice campaign? I mean, it's a... Uh, well, no, he said he didn't know where to begin. It's important to let him flaff on, didn't it? <laughs> well, in just a minute, everybody flaffs on as best they can. No, no, I, no, no you actually, do, but... it was deviation because he'd already begun quite some time ago, and he knew how to. <laughs> Listen, I've seen both of you flap at different times, and <laughs> if you call that flapping... <laughs> Six seconds, Tim. Metaphor starting <laughs> now. My... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tony, you got in first. I don't want it well, anymore. there's a hesitation, clearly, because he never wanted to talk on this subject. No. <laughs> but you've got in on a correct challenge at Thank last. You. Five seconds. Metaphor starting now. My favourite metaphor is never walk towards a... Uh, Jenny Chan. That's not a metaphor. No, He's making right, it up. He's out. No clue. He's, I've got one. I've been thinking hesitation. for a whole minute. And there, it's a hesitation. It's all right. Hesitation. That's well, what he did. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, Jenny, you've got half a second. Do you want to actually give us a metaphor? Yes, I've just thought it's taken... The ants. Well, wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> Keep you going for half bit. a second first till the whistle goes. Half a second starting now. I just didn't start for God. <laughs> no! 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 I was born... Can I just say it? Yeah. I don't care about points. I'm not... You, you know, right, right. I've thought of a metaphor. All right, Graham came in first with but his challenge. He gets metaphor. a point for speaking when the whistle <laughs> should have gone. And Jenna's going to give us her metaphor starting now. The ants are black pepper on the pavement. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> it's kind of you to indulge the ramblings of an old woman, isn't it? <laughs> it would have been better if you'd said there were so many specks on the pavement, they look like ants on black paper. That's that, similar that because you said that you were lying. <laughs> Even I, I knew that. Not according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Right. So, Jenny, we give you a bonus point for your metaphor, which some of us don't think was a metaphor. <laughs> and, um, Graham, you got a point for speaking when the whistle should have gone. <laughs> and we move on to the next subject. <laughs> And Tony Hawkes, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is stage fright. Give us your opinion on stage fright starting now. Picture the scene, a man stooped over a toilet bowl, retching to such a degree because he is terrified of the Southampton audience. Nicholas, I said, do not fear them. They will love you. Don't panic. Tim, you challenged. I thought there was a pretty big gap. Uh, we well, could have driven a, driven yeah, a truck. Well, it, it, it was so around. devious that I, I yeah, would have given it to you one anyway. Yeah. Very, very unfair to you, Mr. Chairman, as well. Well, it was utterly <laughs> devious. Try <laughs> <laughs> yes. retching more than vomiting, really. <laughs> 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 anyway, Tim, you have a correct challenge. 44 seconds, the uh, stage fright starting now. I remember a tale which is a very long and rather boring. Uh, Tony Challenge. We've only got a minute. <laughs> A bonus point to Tony because the audience enjoyed the interruption, but it was an incorrect challenge. So, Tim, you have another point for being interrupted, and you keep the subject. 41 seconds, stage fright starting now. There was this actor who was so scared that he would get his line wrong. All he had to say was, it is, after the John Gielgud playing Henry II, or possibly Richard III, said, is that my Lord Worcester over yon hill? And he just had to say that one line, which I gave you. <coughs> Uh, Jenny Challenge. He said line twice. I did have one. Yes. one, one, one well, you'll line never get the end of the joke. Yet. You'll never get the end. Of the joke. <laughs> I think a lot of us know it actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, is that the one you advertise as long and boring? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jenny got in first. Twenty-two seconds. Stage fright. Jenny, starting now. Pre-show nerves and stage fright are different. The difference being <laughs> different and different. A difference. Yes, different. I think and different. you'll find. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, you're right, Jenny. 18 <laughs> seconds, Jenny, on stage fright, starting now. Stephen Fry had a West End wobbly, didn't he? When he was meant to be doing Simon Gray's cellmates, went running off to... Ru <laughs> <laughs> Graham challenged first. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't run off to... <laughs> did he? <laughs> Graham, you have 10 seconds on stage fright, starting now. My career as a highwayman was a brief one, because <laughs> I suffered from stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> Coach would come down the hill, and I think this guy. <laughs> so Graham Norton speaking as the whistle gained that extra point, and he's now in the lead, but only one ahead of Tim Rice and Tony Hawks, equal in second place. And they are not many points ahead of Jenny Eclair. <laughs> Tony, it's your turn to begin, uh, and it is the subject is off the cuff. Something that happens in this game an awful lot. Talk about it starting now. Speaking off the cuff is a vital ingredient if you are going to do well on this program. As Nicholas said when he introduced this round, and may I say, what a fine chairman he is. <laughs> I don't think people have said 
this enough. We may have to talk on any subject that has thrown us it. It could be visiting the doctor, it could be limerick. Uh, Jenny, a challenge. Could be. It could, could be. Could, Repetition yeah. of could be. So, Jenny, coming in, last round, great flourish. <laughs> 30, <laughs> 39. 39 seconds available, off the cuff, starting now. I have realised whilst playing this game, just a minute, I am no good at off the cuff. I need pen, paper and a decent script writer. I'm not sure where the phrase came from. Was it when, in the olden days, music hall comics forgot their jokes and wrote them on their cuffs? This is a trick I used to great effect when I was a teenager doing my A-levels at school. <laughs> I scribbled the dates of the Boer War up and down my Four arms down. And uh, Graham Norton challenge. This is some sort of fashion war we haven't heard of. <laughs> the Boa War. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know her pronunciation was a bit strange, but <laughs> under the pressure of keeping going and looting her cuffs, I think that um, we did know what she meant, and she did mean the Boer War. So, so I'm we, no, no, no. We, <laughs> we enjoyed the interjection, but. Uh, the uh, Jenny, you still have you have a point, of course, too, for an incorrect challenge, and you're surging forward, and um, <laughs> and you have 11 seconds off the cuff, starting now. Or maybe it came from you know when. Uh, Tim and Dry's challenge. Two came from. Yeah. It came from before, yes. yes. And so Tim, you've got him with eight seconds on off the cuff, starting now. I find that as one gets older, you get much better at being off the cuff. These young things just haven't got a clue. <laughs> and... So, as I said, it was to be the last round. Let me give you the final situation. Jenny got a nice lot of points in that round, but she still finished up just in fourth place. But no, no, no. Uh, Tony was just ahead of her with 18 points, and then uh, uh, Tim Rice was just a couple ahead of him. But two points ahead again was Graham Norton. So, Graham Norton's the winner this week. Thank you very much indeed. It only remains for me to say... A deep thank you to these wonderful players of the game. In the sequence, I see them now. Tony Hawks, Graham Norton, Jenny Eclair, and Tim Rice. I thank Janet Stablehurst for helping with the score and blowing her whistle so delicately. And, of course, we thank our producer, Claire Jones, for her contribution in making sure that it all comes together. And uh, we are indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this game originally, and we are deeply indebted to this audience in Southampton, who've cheered us on our way magnificently. <laughs> from you, from the panel, from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in the next time we play. Just a minute. Oh. Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, but also my great pleasure to welcome four stars from the great firmament of comedy performance and writing who have joined me to sparkle and shine here tonight. And they are Paul Merton, Graham Norton, Barry Cryer, and Clement Freud. Will you please welcome all four of them? Beside me, it's Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep a score, and she'll blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And, as usual, I'm going to ask our four players of the game to speak, if they can, on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the radio theatre in the heart of Broadcasting House, which is in the heart of this great metropolis of London, and we have in front of us a great cosmopolitan audience drawn from all quarters of the greater London area and beyond. Welcome to them as they cheer us on our way, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. And we'll begin the show this week with Graham Norton. And who better? Graham, the subject is a sore point. <laughs> but will you talk about a sore point in this game, if you can, starting now? A sore point is essentially any point that is stuck in you. Ow! Gee, that smart. Golly, that hurts. 
Ouch! These are the sorts of things you might say when attacked by a point that turns out to be sore. Obviously, a blunt point wouldn't be as sore as a point that wasn't. Clement Roy Challenge. Hesitation. Yes, I think there was hesitation. Do you? Yes, I do. <laughs> you can look at me with that curt look on your face, Graham, but I have to agree with hesitation. Clement, you have a point for a correct challenge, and you take over the subject, a sore point, and 41 seconds are available starting now. A sore point, like star point, is a little-known beauty spot in the West Country. Uh, uh, very crowd challenge. Uh, well, I think it's deviation. Asor is a small coastal town in India. <laughs> Maybe of the identical name. I don't know. Perhaps we could ask the audience or uh, no. any passing I'm not going to risk that. Not with this one. <laughs> uh, I'm just in the fact that there is a sore point in uh, uh, the West Country. Do you know that for a fact? No, I don't know for a fact. Well, I trust Clement's. Well, thank you. If you, if you well, if you trust Clement's knowledge, then Clement has an incorrect challenge. And I've got him a point, haven't You've I? You've got him a point, yes. yes. But you're very generous like that. I know. Yes. I know. I'm a fool to myself. <laughs> <laughs> An incorrect challenge, Clement. So you have 34 seconds on a sore point starting now. A sore point on your body can be almost any place, anywhere, which pains you. Sore, you tell the doctor. And he says, take your clothes off, which you do <laughs> readily. And sore points tend to make medics look down beneath the belt because that is the most usual place for a uh, Barry Crouch challenge. I felt he was drawing to a close. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's wound down oh. so far that it was almost hesitation, so we give you the benefit of the doubt, Barry, and have so 12 seconds from you on the sore point starting now. A saw is a small coastal town in India with a promontory <laughs> sticking out from it known as a saw point. Uh, a short uh, uh, <laughs> hesitation. And what hesitation? Indeed. You made your point? Yes. But it was you paused. And I feel sore. I know. <laughs> and Paul's gone in with four seconds on the subject of sore points starting now. Well, if doctors say to me, did it burn at the tip? I said, I've never tried setting fire to it, to be honest. <laughs> in this game. Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point on this occasion was Paul Merton. And Paul has now got three points. Clement Freud has two, Barry Cry has one, and Graham, who started so magnificently, hasn't got any. But that's just a minute, isn't it? Mm. Barry, would you take the next round? The subject is punch. Tell us something about punch in this game starting now. Punch, a historic magazine now owned by the gentleman who runs Harrods, which I would buy if I won the lottery, if it weren't up for the hassle of trying to get an Egyptian passport. Years ago, I did in fact write for the aforementioned uh, magazine publication. Magazine, I said twice, I, I know, think. and Graham challenged. I've it three times now, Barry. Yes. Three times. <laughs> Graham, you've gone in, you've got a point for a correct challenge, you have 43 seconds. You tell us something about punch starting now. Punch is delicious served at parties. In France, they refer to punch as au fond du coffre, which means from the back of the cupboard. Yes, any old drink you've ever brought back from holiday will be poured into a bowl. Um, uh, Paul. Oh, repetition of bag. Yes. Go back, back, back of the cupboard. Oh, back I do care. Yes. 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 Paul Merton, you have a correct challenge. You have 29 seconds. Tell us something about punch starting now. Henry Cooper was fighting Cassius Clay in 1963. This is before the Muhammad Ali. Lee Boxer became world champion and oh I can't say any <laughs> Cooper <laughs> Sorry, I think he was flagging a bit there. He was, oh. yes. He lost his gist uh, um, and I mean gist. Yes, <laughs> just, the flow, you lost your thought. Anyway, twenty seconds, Barry. A uh, punch starting now. Punch had a very famous dining room with a carved dining table and round the uh, walls were uh, ten and point challenge. Were two dinings. That's right. And ten I do punch. my own. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, 16 seconds, Punch starting now. I used to write for Punch many years ago. It was a humorous magazine which came out weekly. And the editor was a man called Alan Corrin. Uh, <laughs> Meditation. Yes, I don't know why Alan should make him pause, but he did. <laughs> And um, seven seconds for you, Paul, with a correct challenge on Punch starting now. The Alan Collin that Clement mentions now appears on Radio Ford in a news quiz, but as indeed Mr. Freud said, he did use... Uh, just a minute, Clement challenge. Deviation. Why? Well, I'm not Mr. to begin with. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mrs. Freud. I had no idea. 
I had no idea the operation had come through. Uh, <laughs> but while you are knighted, Clement, it is still possible... I thought you were knitted. It. <laughs> in the... uh, I'm sorry. Well, it is still possible to throw you in the show business sense of saying, Mr. No. You mean none of us must ever call you Mr. again? No, Clement is fine. <laughs> I don't think he was strictly deviating from just a minute or the rules. So, Paul, you have a, 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 a point of point. Half a second. Nothing. No. Knight of the Realm. <laughs> Paul Martin speaking as the whistle went. Gained an extra point and has got a strong lead at the end of the round. Clement Freud, will you take the next round? The subject is the Millennium Wheel. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. Last week, Sir Paul Merton invited me <laughs> to come onto the Millennium Wheel, which is a splendid erection near the River Thames, sponsored by British Airways. And if you go on the Millennium Wheel often enough, you get an upgrade each time you fly. <laughs> to, I would like people to bear that in mind, because it would be sad if the Millennium Wheel didn't have as many customers as it deserves. <laughs> A Paul Merton challenge. Deviation, I'm not a sir. <laughs> that's a good challenge, actually. That yeah. is correct. Well, that's a better challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, the Millennium Wheel, 35 seconds, starting now. It goes round and around and around and around. <laughs> Clement, yes, yes, yes. Hoisted on his own petard. Right, 31 seconds. You've got it back, Clement. The Millennium Wheel, starting now. It gyrates and revolves and spins uh, and rotates. Graham, it's Graham. It's just... It doesn't gyrate. <laughs> no. I've been honest. No. Well, I don't know what you were doing in it, Clement. Uh, yes. <laughs> Gyratory system at Hanger Lane in London doesn't judder. <laughs> gyratory means going round. Well, no, the gyratory hanger system means standing still in a car. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, no. Although, strictly speaking, you can't stand still in a car. No, yeah, but don't let's go into all that. <laughs> Unless you've got the roof rack. I have decided that Graham has a correct challenge. But gyrate he... means to go round. <laughs> Clement was right. Well, sir, he said it was right. right. <laughs> gyrate? Does it mean to go round, gyrate? <laughs> all right, Clement, they all just... <laughs> 26 seconds still available, the Millennium Wheel starting now. It circulates <laughs> in a clockwise direction from left to right if you stand to the south of the Thames and in the reverse motion should you be on the north side. <laughs> I, I think we've, I think we've uh, worked out which way it turns. Uh, um, hesitation. And I think we've worked out where it is as well yeah, yeah. and he couldn't uh, find yeah. another way for Thames. So, 11 seconds, the Millennium Wheel with you, Paul, starting now. I've not yet travelled on the Millennium Wheel, but people I speak to say it is a wonderful experience. I'd probably, my luck, I'd probably go up probably. <laughs> uh, Barry, Graham, you tell You probably. So, Graham, at last you've got in on the Millennium Wheel, three seconds, starting now. The Millennium Wheel is like making love. Fifteen minutes beginning, ooh, we're nearly there, and then... <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you did get in, uh, Graham. You spoke of the whistle wind, gained that extra point, and you're one point behind Clement Freud, who's a few points behind Paul Merton, who's in the lead, and Barry Crow, you're putting up in fourth place, and Paul Merton, your turn to begin. Telling tales. That's the subject. Talk on it, starting now. Once upon a time, there lived a little man in the woods. His name was Barnaby Barnaby, and he <laughs> used... <laughs> Graham, your life came on first. Are you trying to trick me? <laughs> One word. That was his name, Barnaby Barnaby. One word. But we work in the realm of sound on radio. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what we hear is more important than what is written. And what we hear is Barnaby Barnaby repetition. And but he's only got one name. That's his name, Barnaby Barnaby. And in the, in the rules of just a minute... Am I to be penalised because this <laughs> man has a silly name? Yes, you are penalised because in just a minute, Barnaby Barnaby is repetition. And Graham buzzed first. So he's in with 55 seconds on telling tales starting now. In my brother-in-law's <laughs> farm, we used to play a game called telling tales. It revolved around the dairy, where we put the cows against a wall and pull their tails out of little holes. And then we'd have to walk along a path and guess which cow was which. Uh, Clement Freud, 
sorry. Hadn't we had a cow? No, we had cows before, and it was cow the second time. God. <laughs> and, All right, then. Right. 39 seconds, Paul. Uh, sorry, Graham, on telling tales, starting now. Of all the tales I've been told, I think my favorite is that of Tiern and Nog, which is the Gaelic expression meaning land of the young. There was a fair maiden who lived upon this small thing surrounded by water, and there you remained not old forever. She came to the mainland to see a boy or something. I don't know. And Right, Rather dilatory. Was there a repetition of old? Was this an old tale you referred to when you started? And then another old came along, and Clement's shaking his head in a very gyratory manner. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's right. Uh, Graham. I apologise. Right, Graham. 11 well, seconds. still got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Telling tales starting now. In a library once, thank uh, you. Um, Paul Chance. <laughs> well, if you hadn't argued with Barnaby Barnaby, you wouldn't be in this place. <laughs> So give Paul a bonus point because we enjoyed the comment or the interruption, but Graham gets another point for being interrupted, and he keeps on with telling tales. <laughs> Eleven seconds starting now. Telling tales is a super thing to do in the library of a Saturday afternoon. Uh, Clement Floyd Challenge. We have had the library before. Yes. Have we? Yes. Uh, no, no, we never had a library. Library, library, it's one word. <laughs> <laughs> He was in the cow shed before. No, we no, had no. the library. Actually, I might have been in the library a second ago. Yeah. You were, right. Well done, Clement. Seven seconds, telling tales. <laughs> Starting now. It was Once upon a time in the no. forest, there were two small girls called Polly and Maisie who followed... <laughs> so Clement Clive was speaking as a little wrench. Graham that extra point of another point in the round. He's now one point behind Graham Norton, who's two points behind Paul Merton in the lead, and Barry is bringing up a very strong rear, and, um... Tip <laughs> it what he knows. <laughs> and Graham Norton, we're going to hear from you again. It's your turn. Mm. Yes. And the subject now is the pyramids. Tell us something about the pyramids in just a minute, starting now. In Egypt, mummies are kept in the pyramids, whereas in Ireland, they're kept in structures known as the bungalows. Uh, Barry Crowd chance. Repetition of kept. Yes. <gasps> Who kept? Well, listen. Well, listen. Barry. Tell us something about the pyramids, and you have 54 seconds starting now. Howard Carter, the famous archaeologist, is always associated with the pyramids and the sarcophagi therein. And there is a legendary tale of the aforementioned man seeing a bandaged figure coming out, pressing its lips to its bandaged appendages at the end of its arms, which he then sang, I saw a mummy kissing sandy claws. <laughs> this tale... Uh, Tell us quite challenged. <laughs> oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> I'm always going like that. <laughs> but unfortunately, you did repeat mummy, and Clement got in first. 32 seconds. Pyramids, um, Clement, starting now. The Pyramids is a not very well known pop group consisting of seven people who were previously called the wife fronts because they gave such enormously reliable support. <laughs> the pyramids, if you look at them carefully, consists of a violinist, a pianist, an oboe player, and a flautist. Two chaps on a euphonium, <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> I think they let you go, Clement, because they enjoyed watching you struggle, but um, eventually uh, an act of mercy, poor challenge, and he's got the pyramids. Six seconds starting now. Mr. Barnaby was the man who invented the pyramids back in the early days of the 18th century. And... Paul Martin speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject, acupuncture. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. I know that acupuncture is said to be enormously effective, but I have no great faith in it. I met a man who went to an acupuncturist, and as a consequence, because the acupuncture expert gave his treatment to many people who wanted to stop smoking, this man began to start to smoke. He had 46 cigars on the day after his initial appointment, and thereafter was a tremendous fan of Claire's, Woodbine's, Will's, 
Capstan. Barry Crouch. Yes, an inquiry. What was the last brand? Drills. <laughs> no, it was hesitation. W D. It was hesitation. I, 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 on a point of information, was it drills? Wills. Oh, Wills. Wills. Wills, Wills. Wills whips. That's right. Yes, that, that dates you. That goes right back to pre-war. Yes. No. No. Carbon dates me. That. <laughs> <laughs> Only, Valid. only a camel can satisfy me. Yes, Nicholas. <laughs> and 26 seconds, acupuncture starting now. Acupuncture practiced by <laughs> acupuncturists. Do they get pins and needles, I ask myself. <laughs> I have been completely pierced in my time, and I can vouch for the uh, efficacy. Uh, efficacy. Uh, oh, Lord, Could you hear the F? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, well, but there was a bit of effort. Was there anything? Yes, I was He was yeah. struggling with efficacy. Yes. And you've gone in, Graham, with 14 seconds on acupuncture starting now. I believe acupuncture is very effective because no matter what is wrong with you, someone sticking a big needle in you is going to distract you from that pain, <laughs> ache, or disease. You're going to think, actually, whatever is ailing me isn't so bad after all. <laughs> well, Graham Norton. Again, speaking as the whistle went of another point has moved forward. He's now only one point behind our leader, Paul Merton. Then comes Clement Freud and Barry Cry in that order. Graham, your turn to begin. And the subject is my address book. Tell us something about my address book. Don't make my personal one. <laughs> Take the subject. Start now. My address book reads like a veritable who's that of show business. <laughs> yes, everyone is listed on their N for nobody. I worry sometimes that the famous people I meet never seem to want to become my friend. I worry about it sometimes late at night as I cross and turn. Uh, Barry Crouch. Well, there are two sometimes is. Yes. So, uh, I sometimes worry about it. Sorry. Mm. It's all right. Sorry. It's all right, no? I'll never be your friend. <laughs> Barry is not in your book. with a correct challenge. 43 seconds, Barry. My address book starting now. My address book is a veritable panoply of my life, representing, as it does so many people I have met through the years, Lou Amour. What a superb name. A beautiful woman in Cheltenham. Uh, anywhere. Um, <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> Why you did I say anyway? Because you thought of Lua Moore. And yes, I went. Did. You went. I could see it in your eyes, actually. She's listening. You wrote Western novels. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you press first, Paul, in hesitation. Ten seconds, my address book starting now. I'm possibly the last person who has an address book without postcodes. London W1H14. <laughs> Then Clement Clive was speaking at the whistle end. Then that extra point of another point in the round. He's now equal to Grant Norton and Paul Merton is still just ahead of them. And Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Brussels. Tell us something about Brussels in this game starting now. It's very important if you have a lisp, a hyena who ate every other day, an official who worked for... Uh, <laughs> challenge. Drugs. <laughs> Yes, so what's the challenge well, in the movie just a minute? It's a deviation, isn't it? What? It's not a hyena and an official every other day. We would have heard about it by now, surely. I'm sure you're right. If there had been a hyena eating every day in the European Parliament in Brussels, we'd have heard about it by now. Mm. Paul, you have the correct challenge. <laughs> and you have 24 seconds. Brussels starting now. I keep a hyena in the attic and I feed it with Brussels sprouts every other Wednesday, which isn't very good because ideally they should be eaten every day. It's a curious creature, the Brussels sprout, because it's one of those funny looking... Uh, Graham challenge. It's, not, it's not, a, not a creature, really, is it? The Brussels sprout. No, it's, it's, a, it's a creation of God. <laughs> yes. yes. No, it's a deviation. Oh, oh. No, no, it's not a ball. <laughs> not not a at all. It's a vegetable. <laughs> Nothing like one. Uh, Graham, 12 seconds. Tell us something about Brussels starting now. Brussels is a very depressing, dreary place. I would rather shoot myself than go there. I don't intend to get a free ticket from Eurostar for this big plug I'm giving that horrible city now. Oh, it smells. <laughs> Oh, a keen contest for points about the uh, honours and humour are pretty evenly divided. As we go into the last round, you might be interested to know that Graham Norton is trailing Paul Merton by one point, and a few points behind him is Clement Freud, and a few points behind is Barry Grubb. 
And, Paul, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is water under the bridge, and you start now. It's a very necessary ingredient for the game poo sticks. The rules are simple. You drop your stick into the water and then run to the other side of the bridge to see who's come out first, whether you or your opponent. Simon and Garfunkel had a marvellous hit record in 1969, I believe. It was written by Paul S. Uh, um, Clement Shams. Sorry, I thought you'd said Paul before. Yes, it did yeah. sound like it. No, 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 Simon and Garfunkel. Um, <laughs> not much like Paul, but it doesn't matter. And um, 40 seconds. Water under the bridge. Still with you, Paul, starting now. Well, it's got to go somewhere, I suppose. So you stick a bridge over a bit of water, and there you are. Uh, Clement Boy Challenge. Repetition of stick. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, listen, Clement. 36 seconds. Water under the bridge, starting now. Water under the bridge is absolutely okay. What you have to worry about is water over the bridge. <laughs> it's called a flood. <laughs> uh, Barry, you <laughs> Barry, you challenge. The flood dried up rather. rather no, no. <laughs> 26 seconds, Barry, with you. Water under the bridge starting now. The only time I visited Brussels, I stayed in a hotel where the concierge looked rather like an ugly Khrushchev. And when I went up to my room, I plugged in my electric razor and all the lifts stopped. Larry, you, you challenged... You challenged... <laughs> I press my button. You challenged... Yeah, yes, but... I was boring myself to tears. I know you were. Because you were talking on the wrong subject. <laughs> oh! Oh, I'm sorry. You see the effect. This is, the this, this, is, this is how this game gets people after time. Well, I, but you very cleverly challenged yourself. Yes. And I knew there was something wrong. I yes, had that yes. feeling. So what is your challenge? I deviation? Like a, uh, deviation. Yes, well, that is the, the correct program. challenge. That is the correct challenge, Barry. Yes. Well, listen to yourself. Yes. And um, <laughs> so there's a correct challenge. I had to give you a point for a correct challenge. <laughs> And say it My just... boy has worked. Yes. And you keep the subject. What was so the you subject? Never... <laughs> it seems so long ago, Nicholas. <laughs> the subject was water under ah. the bridge. Yes. And there are 14 seconds left, starting now. A charming older lady went into a music shop in the West Country and asked for the record of trouble over bridge water. The <laughs> assistant disabused her of this notion and informed her it was, in fact, a hit by Simon and Garfunkel, which she then purchased. Oh. So very quiet and speaking as the whistle went, brought this game to an end with a magnificent flourish and uh, grace panache and style and finish in a very strong fourth place. <laughs> oh. I've never had anybody finish in fourth place and get a bigger cheer than that. <laughs> but it was a strong finish because, Barry, it is your contribution which you enjoyed. And in a very good third place was Clement Freud. And in a very, very, very admirable second place was Graham Norton. And in a fine first place, only two points ahead of Graham, was Paul Merton. So we say, Paul, you are the winner this week. Thank you very much. It only remains me to say thank you to these four fine players of the game. Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Barry Cry, Graham Norton. I thank Janice Staplehurst for helping me with a score and blowing her whistle so delicately. And also we thank Claire Jones, who is our producer and director and has to make sense of all the things we do. And we're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this magnificent game. And we're indebted to our audience who come in off the streets of London just to cheer us on our way. <laughs> they've been warm, they've been passionate, and we've loved them dearly. So from our lovely, passionate audience, from our passionate panel, and from your passionate chairman, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in the next time we play, just a minute. Until then, goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.